Good morning and welcome to this May 18th uh, edition of the Tulare County Board of Supervisors. We will start this morning with the Pledge of Allegiance and then a moment of silence. The pledge will be led by Supervisor Makari. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, we will start our meeting today with Board of Supervisor Matters, and we will start on my left with Supervisor Vanderpool. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's been a busy few weeks, and uh, things are starting to pick back up. Uh, in addition to meeting with uh, various county department heads and uh, constituents, uh, had a lot of different activities uh, that have been taking place. But one uh, event that I wanted to highlight uh, for this week uh, it's great that uh, we were able to start seeing fundraisers resume. Um, the Comics for Kids fundraiser will be this Friday at 5.30 at the Gardens in Tulare. Um, that fundraiser is specifically to raise funds for the Boys and Girls Clubs of the Sequoias and their Tulare chapter. Uh, it's always a great event and uh, good laughs and real comedians, not fake ones. Like Amy. you. <laughs> And uh, it's just a, a lot of fun, and I appreciate uh, all the effort that goes into uh, uh, supporting organizations that support our kids. So um, that's the only public event that I wanted to highlight for today, uh, Madam Chair. All right. Supervisor Townsend. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, on Wednesday the 12th, I attended the Portobello Welcome Center uh, ribbon cutting. Uh, they've been operating as the low barrier uh, shelter for homeless uh, for a little while, but they just had their official uh, ribbon cutting on Wednesday. So that was very nice to see that uh, going and uh, we'll hope to see some more like it around. It was just kind of a perfect placement there um, where they have it in Porterville. Um, on Monday, we all uh, attended the TCAG TCTA uh, meeting and uh, all, as always a lot to talk about. Some exciting things coming up in the area uh, with, uh, with funding that's been coming down um, through the state and uh, uh, Ted Smalley and our the TCAG staff have, all been, have been very, very good at sort of bundling things together and getting us uh, lots of money for lots of projects where we could really use it with roads and bridges throughout the county. Uh, later today, uh, I'll jump on a call, depending on how long we go here, <laughs> with our Eastern Thule uh, Groundwater Sustainability Agency. We're having a, a special meeting uh, kind of regarding special management zones, um, really around cities. Um, you know, where do you stop with the, with the overall management zone and start with the city uh, zones? And so we're going to kind of hash out some of those details. Then on Friday uh, the 21st, I have a, a Sierra View Foundation meeting uh, for the Sierra View Medical Center. Um, and I want to take a, just a, a quick minute. I had a, a call from a, a friend uh, yesterday, uh, a friend and a, and a constituent in the Porterville area. Uh, he'd been having some issues with uh, trying to understand um, some tax assessments on his uh, property that was transferred from his uh, family to him. And uh, he'd really been working on it for quite a while. And he called just to tell me, uh, thank you for one of the county employees at the assessor's office, Virginia Strouser. And uh, he said, you need to keep her. Uh, she has uh, answered questions that I've been uh, on, you know, looking for answers for about a year. And uh, she was able to take care of it that day. So I did call Virginia yesterday and congratulate her and tell her to keep up uh, the good work uh, because that, uh, that whole customer service uh, mentality is something that we need to have at the county. And, and, we're, and I think it's really come a long ways in the past uh, decade or so. But I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and also a couple of others uh, that are being promoted that uh, Brooke Sisk, our, our general service agency director, uh, sent out congratulations to Laura Silva and Kyle Taylor for being uh, promoted to deputy directors within the GSA. And watching them uh, uh, on the uh, facilities committee, uh, I can see that those are really well-deserved and look forward to great things from them. Madam Chair, that's it. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Macari.
good morning, everyone. Uh, as Supervisor Vanderpool uh, stated, it's nice that things are starting to ramp up and get going. We've had a very busy week and looking forward to many more. Uh, this last week, I, I attended a meeting with the American Legion at the Vice City Memorial Building. Uh, met with those veterans over there and, and uh, as they're getting prepared for the Memorial Day weekend and the Avenue the Flags. I, uh, a couple years ago, volunteered with them. They didn't do anything last year, so I'm looking forward to uh, working with those guys again. They were a great group, and we got out there and did a lot of good work. I actually did a CPR recertification through my four-wheel drive club. That uh, was something that we we all do and take part in. Uh, we're up uh, when we are up working the force, volunteering at the Forest Service. It's nice to have people that are first aid and CPR trained. So I recertified for that. I came in and did a video with the HHSA regarding um, uh, fire management and, and COVID, and, and uh, so we did a video. Hopefully that'll come out and uh, soon, and we can see. Uh, I'd like to see the end product. I, I don't know. I'm not a very photogenic kind of guy. I attended the Exeter Ambassador Lunch uh, on uh, Thursday and also the Exeter Chamber Mixer at the B&L Ranch. So blueberry season is here and uh, they have a wonderful you pick uh, blueberry ranch out there. And so we, we went out there for the Exeter Chamber Mixer. <clears throat> on Friday morning, I attended the Imagine You Grand Reopening. It's amazing the work they did. A lot of people sat stagnant during COVID. They did not. They did an amazing amount of work there. and. Uh, it's exciting to see and very happy for them to uh, start opening again and, and, and helping our children out. Now, on Saturday morning, uh, Supervisors Chucklin and I attended the Visaya Breakfast Lions Club car show. That was a great event. There were over 300 registrations, and so we got to spend most of the day there. And uh, we found a little place, a little hideaway there called what, B Suite uh, Bakery that was, uh, we like to shop local, and so we went to that local place for coffee and uh, Amy bought a, a couple, I don't know, three or four boxes or something, if I remember correct. <laughs> no. So I have pictures. <laughs> You're the donut guy. Uh, afterwards, I went to the uh, Go Native event at the Kui Oaks Preserve, where they had a wonderful uh, event out there, and they did a lot of, uh, there were some people learned about the native traditions, and uh, they had some projects, and they lost some vendors out there, so that was a great thing. Uh, yesterday, I had a meeting with Charter Spectrum, regarding their services they're providing in Tulare County and, and their, their high-speed internet that they have. It sounds really good. They're wired, so they can't get everywhere, but sounds like they really uh, are innovative moving forward. I also attended the TCAG meeting <clears throat> and uh, the Eastern Kauia uh, Groundwater State Agency Advisory Committee. And tonight, and last night, I went to the AMBETS meeting uh, in Tulare and met with them as they're pre making preparations for Memorial Weekend. Uh, this coming week, I'm going to beat the leadership by said graduation. Uh, our own Alicia uh, graduated, so I'll be there for that to congratulate her. Tonight, I'll also attend. There's a meeting regarding the Avenue of the Flags so they can continue with their details. I, my understanding, they're out there right now, but they're going to have uh, further details coming up. We have an Ag Advisory Committee meeting and uh, supporting an Exeter. The Exeter Mercantile is having a grand opening for a little side store that they've started there. I'll, I'll be attending that. We have our retiree qualifications from the Sheriff's Department that I'll be at. Kings River GSA a meeting coming up. There's an administrative hearing on some final findings that I attended on. Friday morning, I'll be with the Breakfast Lions. Again, if I say Breakfast Lions, they invited me to come to their meeting. And Saturday, I'll be volunteering at the Strathmore uh, football uh, golf tournament fundraiser. So it, things are getting busy and uh, it's really exciting to see how things are moving. Thanks. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Valero. All right. Well, good morning, Tulare County. We had a very successful Goshen Town Hall meeting last night. We had approximately 33 people in attendance, including speakers. The evening started with a brief update on all, thing Go all things Goshen and county related, i.e. an update on economic development in the area, along with road projects and opportunities for engagement. <clears throat> Secondly, Katie Meter from Family Services of Tulare County talked about several programs starting up in the community, like parent workshops, counseling, and resources at that site. Lastly, Betsy McGovern Garcia from Self Help Enterprises and Adrian Hillman from Salt and Light 
highlighted details about the Salt and Light Project, which is Neighborhood Village, um, to the Goshen community, as that has been the identified spot for this project. And I know that there has been a concern by some in the community, but I think yesterday's conversation helped rectify some of these concerns from residents. And I want to thank the Board of Supervisors staff for your work on this town hall. Last Wednesday, I attended Good Morning Dinuba, a time and space to bring various stakeholders together for sharing of and reporting on different programs and events happening around Dinuba. Typically, this event brings together people from the city, the school district, business community, and other public sectors. A uh, great turnout after it being on hiatus for over a year. Um, as many know, I do serve as a facilitator for Leadership Northern Tulare County, and last week's day session on state and federal government went really well. We were able to speak with our legislators on uh, different bills that are coming through the various committees um, and that those that impact the Central Valley greatly. And then we also heard from Paul Yoder and Emily Pappas on their roles and responsibilities in Sacramento, along with Daniel O'Connell from the Central Valley Partnership. I also attended the Imagine You reopening celebration with Supervisor McCary and uh, he was able to present on behalf of the Board of Supervisors that certificate of recognition. Uh, that day, I also had a California Volunteers Commission meeting where we discussed monies allotted to public service in the governor's May revise. On Saturday, we bid farewell to two Woodlake Kiwanians who've made a huge impact on the Woodlake community, Chuck and Jenny House. Chuck recently served as a chancellor for a college, was an executive for HP, and has led Media X at Stanford University. And he would often send me data with regards to our COVID highlights in the Central Valley. They are now making their way to the Pacific Northwest to spend time with their immediate family. Yesterday, I filmed my vaccination story with our county media team. I participated in our KTAAA governing board meeting, attended our monthly TCAG meeting, and our regional transportation agency meeting. At the TCRTA, which is our regional transportation authority meeting, we selected our new executive director, Richard Tree. Congratulations to Mr. Tree, who will lead our organization with passion, commitment, and gravitas as we embark on a heavy project for all of Tulare County. And then in the coming week, I have a hashtag lead meeting, a community engagement conversation regarding State Water Board and East Arosi, a visit to Kings River Park with GSA, and a Kings River East GSA meeting. And then I will also be attending the leadership uh, Visalia graduation this evening. And that is all I have, Chair. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me, my turn. Uh, last week, various meetings, I uh, had a web meeting. I. I uh, filmed uh, San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District uh, video that will be coming to a television soon. Um, we filmed two of them, one for the summer, and then I had to don a jacket on the hottest day of the year in Mooney's Grove Park and uh, shoot a winter uh, video, so uh, that should be fun. Uh, Friday, I hosted the uh, virtual Habitat for Humanity birdhouse auction. Um, it was a little different, but let me tell you, it was their highest um, net uh, profit from this event uh, since they've had it. So um, might not have had a, as much excitement and the bidding and whatnot, but I'm thinking because of their you know, lack of overhead and, and all of that, they were able to, to net. So good for, good for them. Uh, I too, as Supervisor McCary said, attended the car show Saturday morning. Um, I think it was probably the most crowded I've ever seen that car show, and I typically go every year. Um, and again, it was a beautiful day. Uh, folks were ready to be out and about. Uh, we were able to see two of our county employees, Patrick Burks, our own administrative aide for the board, and IT customer service manager, Jeff Meter. They both had uh, cars entered in there, so that was nice to see uh, them, and we got a little, little photo. Um, let me see what else is happening. Tonight, I will be attending the leadership graduation also. Um, I've purchased tickets, uh, child welfare services. 
sold tickets uh, for dinner at Tahoe Joe's tonight uh, to help with their toy, toy drive, and I hear that they raised uh, over $2,000 for that, so that's great. Um, we have an air board meeting this week. Uh, I will be sitting in uh, listening to some interviews for some veterinarians for our new spay and neuter clinic, San Joaquin Joint Powers Authority meeting, and then I too will be at the Comic for Kids on Friday, and uh, I may just have to jump up on the stage and take over. And then <clears throat> lastly, on Saturday uh, at the Visalia Mall, they will have their annual, although it was skipped last year, uh, taco truck challenge, and I have the honor of being uh, one of the judges, so I will be eating tacos. And the last thing I want to mention, I don't know if you've read in the news uh, last week, but a longtime Visalian, uh, John Vartanian, passed away. Uh, John um, started the Vintage Press restaurant here with his wife, Arlene, and uh, you know his, his family is involved in that. And I just want to say he was, uh, the Vintage Press is truly world famous. And uh, John uh, was an icon and a legend in the restaurant business here in Visalia. So uh, my condolences to his, his family and also my uh, thanks to, to John for doing such an incredible job in, in making Visalia uh, on the map uh, for the Vintage Press restaurant. So with that, uh, we will move on. And my screen just went blank. And we will present a proclamation recognizing May 16th through 22nd as National Public Works Week in Tulare County. Supervisor Townsend will be making that presence. Are we supposed to open our best presence? All right. National Public Works Week in Tulare County. And uh, just before reading this uh, proclamation verbatim and donning all of this uh, gear, by the way, I saw that the vest was only extra large, so. Yeah, I just noticed that too. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if, that, maybe the hat will work, I don't know. I said, that, I said that the vest and the hat are both 4X, but oh well. Uh, anyway, uh, Public Works Week, but um, you know, our RMA, uh, in fact, I just saw the Public Works Report uh, a couple of days ago and uh, all of the things that have been going on, but uh, we're certainly proud uh, of everything that's done in Public Works here in Tulare County. Uh, I know that personally, whenever I call, and there's these strange calls, you know, that I get about, you know, certain roads or certain bridges or signs or things. Every time that I call, it's a very quick turnaround. Things get done. They're very creative uh, here with the funds that we are able to get. And so uh, with these with these 3,000 miles, you know, of roads here in Tulare County, they're, uh, they do the best that they possibly can with the little that they get to keep those things up and running and to keep us all happy. So um, that's only one part of public works, I know, but it's uh, just that the experience that we have. So I'm gonna read this proclamation recognizing May 16th through 22nd, 2021 is National Public Works Week in Tulare County. Whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities, and services that are of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health, high quality of life and well-being of the people of Tulare County, and whereas these infrastructure, facilities, and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public works professionals who are engineers, managers, and employees at all levels of government and the private sector who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation, water supply, water treatment, and solid waste systems public buildings, and other structures and facilities essential for our citizens, and whereas it is in the public interest for the citizens, civic leaders, and children in Tulare County to gain knowledge of and to maintain a progressive interest and understanding of the importance of public works and public works programs in their respective communities, and whereas the year 2021 marks the 61st annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association and Canadian Public Works Association. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Tulare County Board of Supervisors do hereby recognize May 16th through the 22nd, 2021, as National Public Works Week, signed May 18th, 2021, by Supervisor McCary, Supervisor Vanderpool, Chair Shucklian, Vice Chair Eddie Valero, and Dennis Townsend. Congratulations.
if yeah you wanted to do the photo now right after you speak uh whenever you would like yeah go ahead okay after you speak. all right thank you well first off thank you for your time and good morning reed shanky with the resource management agency uh, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to recognize this week as National Public Works Week. Uh, it's a great opportunity to shine a little bit of a light on what public works means and what the hardworking staff at RMA and public works departments throughout the nation uh, do day in and day out. Uh, if you drove here on a road today, you can thank public works for that. If you took the bus, you can thank public works for that. If you took a shower this morning or flushed a toilet, you can probably thank Public Works for that as well. Not just in Tulare County, but in our cities and states across the nation, Public Works builds and maintains the infrastructure that keeps our communities connected, moving, and safe. For example, in Tulare County, Public Works maintains and operates about 3,000 miles of roadway and over 350 bridges. We provide over a million transit miles each year to cover to over a quarter million passengers. We've recently restored clean, safe drinking water to a community that had gone without for years. And we manage a network of survey monuments and records that literally connect anything ever built within the county. As a society, we tend to only think about public works when we're stuck in construction traffic or when something goes wrong. But really, that's how it's intended to be. Public works professionals focus on our systems, facilities, and infrastructure around the clock in all types of weather so that things run smoothly and so that we don't have to worry how we will get to work or if we can drink the water today. The hard hat and vest are two of the most identifiable symbols of the work that we do, and we wanted to present you each with a set of your own. Hopefully they'll fit. All I ask um, is just that you, you take care of those, and when you look at them, you remember our folks that are out on the street day in and day out. Uh, in closing, I'd like to take the opportunity to again thank you for your support, thank the diverse team that we have here today, and thank those who they represent that couldn't make it because they're back in the office or out on the roads doing the work that they really do love. So again, thank you for this recognition. Thank you. Supervisor Vanderp. You know, I just want to make a real quick comment, Reed. I, uh, I appreciate you bringing some of your team here today. Um, and I do acknowledge the fact that uh, a lot of the team is either back in the office or out in the field doing the work, but uh, I think the, uh, your comments really hit the nail on the head um, when you said that we often don't think about public works unless we're in traffic or we're uh, stuck in uh, road construction, uh, uh, backups, and uh, unless we have problems. And I think that really is, you know, really uh, symbolic of a lot of people's view of public works is you don't really acknowledge it until it's not working or until um, there are being improvements made to it and you're stuck dealing with the, the externalities or the side effects. But I think it's really important that we acknowledge public works and the effort that goes behind public works to make everything run so smoothly. Uh, and so I appreciate you coming here today, uh, bringing some of your team so that they too could be a part of this recognition uh, and I do thank you for uh, the vest and the hard hat, and I think you have a, a much better chance with having those things fit me than you do, Dennis. So uh, appreciate uh, uh, the effort and appreciate all the work that your uh, men and women do to uh, make the public works in Tulare County happen and be as strong as they are. I think we might need a bigger hat for Pete, though. <laughs> so, um, Supervisor Valero? Yes. Thank you, Reed, for that. Um, and I just want to share that your agency is the agency that connects the dots from the unincorporated communities to our cities. And all of the things that you do in between uh, speak to the hard work of your agency and making sure that we uh, uphold our, our promise to many of the communities that are often forgotten and that need the additional resources to keep their community sustainable. So again, thank you for that work. All right, with that, we will step down into the well and don our safety vest and hat. Yeah, yeah, put them on. Come on. Heck, I might wear this for every meeting now. This is a hard hat. I'll get it on. I don't know if it'll zip.
I want to see Dennis. I gotta enjoy having him on, guys. We don't have to look, you know, worry too much on that side of the year. <laughs> yeah, you can run with that. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, that's Pee Wee Herman. All right. Moving right along, I'm very excited about this next item. This is a a presentation from the Tulare County Economic Development Corporation President and CEO, Nathan Ollie, regarding an overview of the fiscal year 21-22. Hi, Nathan. To where today? <laughs> uh, I didn't really get the memo on that, so Just next bring us time, business. I will. And next time <laughs> we'll bring vests or hats or, or something cool, but uh, anyway, I, I do appreciate the time. Uh, this morning, and I am here uh, on behalf of the Tulare County Economic Development Corporation. I'll present a brief update and some, a talk about some of our focus for the 2021-22 uh, the, the year. It's nice to, to see all of you. I believe, Madam Chair, this is the first time we've actually seen each other in person, exactly. which is great. Uh, Supervisor Valero, I believe you and I uh, interacted a little bit on a leadership Northern Tulare County meeting not too long ago, so it's great to see you all. Uh, I've been in the organization about two months just about two months at this point. Uh, a little bit about myself for the past five years. I uh, served as the president and CEO of the Fresno Chamber of Commerce. Prior to that, I was the director of government affairs at the Greater Bakersfield Chamber of Commerce, so certainly very familiar with the Valley and its business climate. Uh, and it's my first time uh, working in Tulare County. My wife is a professor at College of the Sequoias, so we're very familiar with the uh, with the county and, and in, in, in particular the city of Visalia, uh, but I did want to talk a little bit briefly about our organization. That's all one, that matters, really. Okay, <laughs> great. <No. laughs> um, one of the things that, that the themes that just keeps coming back to me as I meet with people and I get to know players in the county is is just opportunity. Uh, you know, as as you folks <laughs> mentioned in your in your supervisor matters, the, the county's starting to reopen again. We're starting to see folks back out on the streets, back in activities, back to work, in the office, which is fantastic. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of that growth. And my message this morning is a very positive one. Uh, we're really rebooting our organization after many years. And uh, I wanna make sure that we're a positive partner in the economic future of our county. Uh, I think we're a very strong value for our investors, both in the private and the public sector. And I hope to give you a little bit of a glimpse of that this morning uh, in a brief presentation. I wanna recognize Sam Diaz as well. Sam is our Vice President of Business Success. He's a native of Porterville and, uh, and represents us very well both in that area and, and throughout the county. And he's directly responsible for some of the, uh, some of the things that we have here. Now, we, there was a, a PowerPoint. I don't know if we, if we have that, if it's something we can pull up. If not, I could. I think if you push on the laptop. Oh, right in front of my face. How about that? Oh, use the mouse. Okay. We're not there yet, Preston. 
Look at that. Okay. Um, perfect. Okay, great. Uh, a quick update on our transition. Uh, we, we, as you can see, we've, we've really looked to reboot our organization in October of 2020. We had the retirement of Paul Saldana. Paul was our president and CEO for 20 years. Uh, retired at the end of October, and we were very fortunate to have former Visalia City Manager Mike Olmos lead our organization through an interim period, uh, through the search uh, selection process, and I was very pleased to be selected as the President and CEO March the 2nd. Uh, just at the end of April, our Board of Directors held a strategic planning session, the first time in several years we've had a, a, an in-depth planning session uh, to develop really a streamlined plan of work. I know that we've been before you in years past and brought you a very expansive plan of work uh, that I would call very ambitious, but not something that, quite frankly, we delivered on to the level that I would expect. Uh, so the board agreed with me on that. We're working very hard to develop a much more streamlined plan of work that really focuses on the core functions of our business, which we consider business attraction, expansion, and to a certain extent, retention as well. Uh, and that's really what the board is committed, along with myself and our staff, is committed to focusing on just really the core functions of that business, doing it very well. Uh, as part of that transition update, we've, uh, we've been hold, holding a lot of introductory meetings. I've really gotten to know people, public officials, city managers, our private sector partners, the members of our board of directors, which is a very diverse 21-member board that really runs the gamut of, of Tulare County. Uh, leaders from other groups, and we just continue to have these meetings on a regular basis as I get up to speed on what's happening in Tulare County, and frankly, I find out what our standing is in the community and how we can be, we can be helpful. One of the things I've found is we're starting to build more partnerships with organizations that we haven't worked with in, in years, uh, and it's whether that's the Chamber of Commerce. I come from a chamber background. Certainly, we have some dynamic chambers of commerce in this, in this county, from Visalia, Tulare, Porterville, and even into the smaller communities. I know the Exeter Chamber was mentioned. These are all groups that we're working with, and, and infrastructure groups such as TCAG. You know, I can't sell Tulare County on an economic development basis without understanding what the transportation issues are, and what understanding what the, the, in, the future of transportation in Tulare County looks like. It's working with the educational committee a community, I should say. We can't sell to Larry County without ensuring businesses that want to come here that there's going to be that workforce pipeline, that folks are going to come in and be able to work. And, and that's something that we, we just haven't done the outreach that I think we should have. And I think now that we're starting to have those conversations it, and, and recognizing that it takes all of us to move our county's economy forward, Folks are very willing to work with us, and we're very willing to work with them. The message that I give is we'll work with anybody, anytime, anywhere, if it's going to bring jobs to Tulare County. So again, our organization's committed to increased communication with our stakeholders, public and private. We want to make sure we understand the individual vision of each community that we, we serve. You know, it's not for me to come in and tell each community this is what you need to do. I need to listen to... Uh, the, elect, the visions of the electeds and the, and the city and county staff that we're working with, uh, particularly with the county and the unincorporated areas, we've had great conversations with the city's planning, or the county's planning staff, I should say, and really understanding what you all see as the vision and how we can work to make that happen. And once again, a focus on the core functions of our mission, business attraction, expansion, retention, and again, sometimes we're going to be the lead, sometimes we're not, but we're willing to work wherever we can however we can. Uh, a quick, see, a quick update here on some county-specific metrics, which I seem to have lost here. I do have some, there it is, some specific county metrics for you. Uh, let's see, there we go. Uh, just so far throughout the county, we have 41 active projects thus far. One of the things that uh, we've done in years past, you may have noticed that's a bit of a smaller number um, but I can tell you, quite frankly, that it's an honest number. We went through our database and really culled some of the projects that had gone dormant for several years, and, and it's important to me to present to you an honest <coughs> accounting of where we're at and what, uh, what we consider to be viable projects coming to, uh, interested in Tulare County. So 41 active projects, 17 of those are carried forward from the previous fiscal year. We've had 36 meetings with the site selection firms and brokers thus far, and we're in constant communication with the local broker community, the development community, as well as public sector staff. Uh, we hold monthly meetings with staff at every incorporated city as well as the county 
to make sure that we're up to speed on what's going on. Uh, relative to the unincorporated uh, sites in Tulare County that really are the purview of this board, we've submitted 22 sites uh, to site selectors thus far this fiscal year. One of the things that we're seeing uh, increased requests for, and this does align a lot with some of the unincorporated areas of the county, uh, sites with derail, direct rail access. That's something we're seeing a lot of, just a really, really high demand right now for sites with rail access. So a lot of that in the unincorporated parts of the county. Uh, larger buildings, 100,000 square feet or more, we're seeing a lot of demand for that. And very specific utilities infrastructure requests, whether that's along a natural gas transmission line rather than a high pressure distribution line, whether that's specific requirements uh, that Edison might be able to meet. We had a great conversation with Edison yesterday about making sure that, that our county is well positioned to meet uh, electricity infrastructure needs for some of these projects. Uh, one of the, the projects that we were able to locate earlier this fiscal year, we assisted on the location of AMR Plastics, AMR Plastics into Tulare. Uh, so a good, a good job creator there in, in, in the Tulare portion of the county. Uh, the most recent project we worked on, we were shortlisted for a plastic injection tubing molding manufacturer. I'm not quite sure what that is, but uh, it, it, it sounds a little more high tech than I'm, I'm equipped for, but uh, we were shortlisted, hoping to get them to Visalia, and unfortunately, uh, the company did select another location. So we're working with them, and that's one of the follow-ups that we plan to do after the fact is, why? What about Tulare County did you find, maybe not lacking, but what was it that led you to choose another site? And I think that's important intel that we need to gather as we come back to you all, we come back to staff, and, and, and work through some of those things. So uh, a quick look at our totals for the year. We've submitted 99 sites thus far uh, throughout, throughout the county thus far this year. Uh, 30 projects, uh, 11 proposals. We've presented incentives uh, information on nine project, uh, excuse me, 19 uh, projects, so which very, very good news there. Uh, a quick look at some of our projects by industry. As you can see, manufacturing, that long gray bar there is head and shoulders. Uh, in terms of the industry sector that we're, we're hoping to see. Uh, folks that are interested in coming to the county, we're seeing a lot of agriculture, obviously, and, and shipping and logistics as that continues to grow, particularly in, in the Visalia Business Park area. Uh, projects by source, where do our projects come from? Uh, we have phone and email. These are folks that just come in and walk in the door or check us out on our website and, and want to learn more about the county. Uh, we do partner with a firm called GSLI, Global Site Location Industries. They're a, a, a site selection firm that we, we partner with to attract leads to the county. Um, and as you can see, we receive a lot of leads from GoBiz, the county's office, or the, excuse me, the state's office of economic development. Uh, we are the, uh, the organization that submits proposals on behalf of Tulare County to the state. Uh, in addition, we receive uh, quite a bit of lead work from the California Central Valley Economic Development Corporation. That's a trade group comprised of all the Central Valley EDCs from Kern County in the south up to San Joaquin in the north. Uh, one thing I do want to highlight very quickly uh, is our new real estate database. You can find that there on our website at TulareCountyEDC.com. Uh, and and I, I want to really highlight that. We launched it at the Economic Summit on April the 30th. Uh, we're very, very proud of this tool, and I do want to thank Sam uh, for his efforts. The, the database vendor that we were using to monitor commercial properties throughout the county uh, was a victim of the pandemic. They went bankrupt right at about Christmas time, unfortunately. So we were able to, just like that, find a new vendor and start working, and, and we've been very, very pleased. Uh, the current uh, database now features about 550 commercial properties across the county, which is about 200 more than we were able to get with our old vendor. They've really done a great job of scraping the data, working with local brokers, and, and doing that sort of work to make sure that, uh, that, that we're giving the most comprehensive database we can find. Uh, so one of the things that you'll see there is you can, you can search through communities, you can search by unincorporated areas, in addition to demographic information and economic information, you can obviously see Google Earth and map images of, of any vacant and available commercial property for sale or for lease throughout the county. Uh, one of the things that we're working on throughout the fiscal year is working with all of our public sector partners. We'll take as much information as we can get to make this a robust database, whether that's zoning information, whether that's property tax information, whether that's uh, utility 
uh, availability information. We want all of that, and, and I, I have to give uh, credit to uh, Mike Washam and Julieta Martinez at the county uh, RMA for working with us and being so able and, and responsive to the work that, that we do uh, and, and working with us to get as much of that public sector information as we can get. Uh, at the moment, the, the database displays 58 properties uh, in unincorporated parts of Tulare County, everywhere from Pixley to Cutler Orosi. We've got some properties up in Springville uh, on the east side. So uh, very, very wide ranging uh, uh, database and I hope you'll spend some time with it and please give us any kind of feedback that you might have. So in summary, we're just getting back to basics. We're really rebooting this organization. There's, you see a renewed focus on increasing leads, uh, developing good proposals that put Tulare County in a great position. We wanna be very proactive with how we uh, generate new prospects. Uh, one of the things that I think is critical uh, to provide public confidence in our organization, as many of you have heard, some of the challenges fiscally that we've dealt with when it comes to uh, to public investment in our organization. It's very critical to me, and I've expressed this to the board, that we create an organization that's well-run, well-managed, has a balanced budget, and I think that leads to that confidence. Um, and improved marketing, again, of Tulare County, and just really going out and selling ourselves uh, and, and building as many relationships with diverse stakeholders as we can to uh, to spread uh, the word about our county. So it's, it's one of those things where I can come and tell you all this stuff, it's all great, I can tell you what you wanna hear, uh, but I'm from Missouri, which you may not know, or you may know is the show me state. So it's an <laughs> obligation for you, for me to show you, and I hope over the next six, nine, 12 months that we'll show you some of this work that we've been able to do and, and really prove our value. So with that, I wanna thank you for your time and I would be happy to entertain any questions. All right, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. And then thank you, Sam, too, for all the work that you, you've been doing. Supervisor Vanderpool. Thank you for the presentation. My pleasure. Nathan. It's uh, great to uh, meet you in person. I spent uh, several years on the EDC board uh, earlier in my career and uh, definitely have a little bit of experience there, but I uh, do appreciate you coming here and sharing uh, with us and I hope you will do that with uh, your other public investors as well. I think that uh, it's easy to uh, forget about you when you don't come in front of us on a regular basis and keep us updated and I think that's important. Uh, that's a, a good return on investment for us and also uh, I think it's important that we have trust in the organization and you right. build trust through transparency um, and you coming before us and really presenting honest information uh, is very important as well. I mean, we'd love to hear about thousands of uh, outreach efforts and events and uh, all of those things, but that's unrealistic. Right. Uh, we know that there are constraints, there are limits, uh, but we need to know what we can do as a county uh, to further zoning, to uh, further uh, advertise and promote uh, various organizations or locations that we may have uh, available here. Um, and, and really, it's not about credit. Uh, it's not about the EDC getting credit. It's not about RMA's economic development team getting credit or uh, the VEDC getting credit. We all just want employers here to give our residents the best opportunity for success in their employment lives. Um, and uh, that is going to help lift this whole county up through a, a diversity of our economy. And uh, I just appreciate uh, you being here and appreciate your renewed or your uh, sort of uh, a return to basics attitude, uh, getting back to what you know you do best, what you're a professional at. Um, and I think that that's a great place to, to begin and to uh, really rekindle relationships and get people to build their faith back in the EDC. So look forward to working with you, Nathan, and uh, uh, definitely made a better choice coming to Tulare County compared to Fresno County. So <laughs> Thank you awesome. very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Supervisor Townsend. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Nathan, uh, for coming over. Thanks for the report. Thanks for bringing Sam along with you and, and uh, all the work that you guys are doing. Hey, um, I just had a quick question on... Um, the, the people that are showing the most interest in coming into Tulare County, uh, I, you, you put up the one graphic that showed the manufacturing. I'm not sure if that was who you were reaching out to the most or that was expressed the most interest. What's kind of the, the top interest that you're looking it's at? A, right it's a little, bit of, a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Um, I think the, uh, when we see leads coming in, it's, it's almost predominantly manufacturing if it's not uh, logistics. So. Uh, yes, in our outreach efforts, we tend to focus on manufacturing because 
we're recognizing that there's opportunity there. Uh, whether, again, it's the Visalia Business Park, there are some great properties along the 99 corridor that folks are interested in. I know that uh, in, in the southeast part, or excuse me, the south part of Porterville, uh, around the airport, there's a lot of economic opportunity there uh, where some manufacturing would, would make sense. So in short, it's a little bit of both, both from our proactive efforts and what we're seeing coming in the door. Uh, you'd be surprised at uh, the, the web traffic that we get on this database. You know, we check our analytics and folks that are up between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. searching real estate databases in Tulare County, and no disrespect, but I could think of better things that I would be doing at 10, <laughs> between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., but that's when they're interested, that's when they're looking, and they're looking predominantly for manufacturing sites. So it's a little bit of both. Okay, great, and, and just uh, I'll just tag on to what uh, uh, Supervisor Vanderpool mentioned. If you need anything, if there's anything you know we can do as a board to help, uh, just let us know. Be My happy pleasure, to do thank it. you. Thank you. Supervisor Valero. All right. Well, uh, thank you for that presentation. And I know that growing Tulare County is important and doing so strategically is also important. And I just am excited to see you at the helm. And I know that you will do swimmingly well and wish you much success as you continue to develop relationships across the county. Just to echo what uh, Supervisor Vanderbilt said is that relationships are very important in making our county grow. And so uh, looking forward to seeing that success from you and your team. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Well, from those comments, I'm starting to feel confident in picking you uh, to lead the organization. No, uh, I never had any doubts and I appreciate you, you being here. Um, it's nice to have a fresh set of eyes, the transparency and the, as was said by Pete, the back to basics of the TCEDC. Uh, we look forward to working with you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, got it. These are general, okay. All right, our next item is public comment. Okay. Members of the public, public may comment on any item not appearing on the agenda. Under state law, matters presented under this item cannot be discussed or acted upon by the board at this time. For items appearing on the agenda, the public is invited to make comments when that item comes up for board consideration. Any person addressing the board will be limited to a maximum of three minutes so that all interested parties have an opportunity to speak with a total of 15 minutes allotted for the public comment period. At all times, we ask that you use the microphone and state your name and address for the record. Um, I do have a comment card here that was turned in and uh, Alberto Aguilar. If we can uh, leave the aisles open, please, so folks can move about freely and we're not um, two jammed up together. We still need to remember social distancing. Either microphone? Either one, Albert. Thank you very much, uh, Amy. Uh, uh, Board of Supervisors, my name is Alberto Aguilar. I'm a resident of Tulare, and I come before you as a private citizen. And the reason that I'm here today is because I went ahead and provided you, I hope I provided you, with a copy of your agenda as posted on your website that allows for the participation of the public via telecommunications and or in person. And Al, I come, can I, do you mind removing your masks? Are you okay with that? I, I can do that. I'm, I'm six yeah. feet away from everybody. Yeah, we can understand. Thank you. I want everybody to hear you. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Again, uh, you are, you're all being provided with a copy of the Tulare County Board of Supervisors Notice of Temporary Procedures for the Board of Supervisors meetings that allow the public to participate during your meetings as required and pursuant to the March 17, 2020 uh, California Governor's Ex Executive Order N2920, relaying <clears throat> to the conveying of public meetings in the light of COVID-19. And, uh, you know, with the situation that we still are under, un under uh, COVID-19, people still being infected, and the number of people that have died, it's very important that we go ahead and continue to follow those procedures so as to go ahead and make sure that uh, we try to combat uh, the, the spread of this disease as much as possible. 
Uh, but I, I, I got to let you know that uh, the Tulare Public Cemetery District, and that's why I brought you their agenda, if you take a look at it, isn't allowing that, okay? <clears throat> it does not allow for public participation via te telecommunications, and it did not post an agenda regarding the meeting that was held on Friday, May 14, 2021, as required under the Brown Act, specifically government code sections, 54953, 54954, 54954.2, 54954.3, and 54956. These are all government codes regarding public meetings, okay? The public has a right to know the date, the time, the location, and the nature of the business that is to be discussed, deliberated, and the outcome of the action taken by the government code, by the, by the government agency, okay? The Tulare Public, Public Cemetery District has the equipment and technology to allow public participation via tele telecommunications, and they have done so during prior board meetings. And all you gotta do is get on their website. We have a website. And on there you can see where in prior meetings the public was being allowed to participate via telecommunications, and so were board members. But that's now changed. Uh, the public cannot participate if there is no notice posted anywhere regarding the date, time, and location of a board meeting. And I, I would like for county council who puts on this government 101 trainings for special districts to address this matter. And I know that we had a meeting scheduled and it was canceled due to Al, lack of a- Al, I hate to cut you off, but you're over time and I have a lot of um, public comment requests today. I understand, thank you very much Thank you, thank you. Okay, Leticia Esparza. Is Ms. Esparza still here? Okay, we'll move along to Luis. Is it Flores? Luis? Okay. My name is Hi. Luis Flores. I do apologize, but I usually don't speak in public. I'm more of a quiet person, but uh, I just wanted to let you guys know as a, um, not as a payee, but as a, what do you call it? Uh, I had a heat stroke, so I have a... Luis, can you pull the microphone oh, yeah. down? Thank you. We want to hear you. That I wish that uh, um, they get a better pay and everything. I'm one of the, uh, um, I'm sorry, I, uh, I forget things. Um, Jesus Christ. Okay, that uh, the work that the that the healthcare providers or our, our oh my goodness our providers, um, son of a. You're okay. Excuse, okay, hold on. You're fine. Relax. Okay, okay, okay yes. <laughs> but I wanted to say is that they're not getting paid enough because um, the job that they do is uh, is very hard. Right now you got a. Um, in and out, starting off at $15 an hour for plus benefits, and you know, and uh, they do a harder job than what flipping a burger uh, costs and everything, or whatever they do to flip a burger. What I'm trying to say is that uh, they they do a hell of a damn job, and uh, they should get paid what they with, like Fresno, with health benefits and everything. That's all I just came to say. But thank you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness, you guys got my heart pumping. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I have a card here that says anonymous. There's somebody that wanted to make a um, comment on IHSS, regarding IHSS. Um, Pam, not yet. This is uh, regarding IHSS. Thank you. Okay. Jennifer Hallstrom. Hi, my name is Jennifer Hallstrom. I'm a provider as of 2018. In that time, I've cooked, cleaned, washed, bathed, 
uh, driven to appointments, cleaning after bowel movements, assist with uh, getting in and out of bed, uh, to appointments. Um, I just want to say that we need a livable wage with hazard pay like states workers, Scott, except in home caregivers. In and out burger employees start at 15 an hour and health benefits. Why can't we? Why can't we? Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Jovita Madrano. Can you take your mask off? Oh, okay. Thank you. And you're translating for Jovita. So we will give her uh, six minutes okay. time. My name is Jovita Medrano. My name is Jovita Medrano. Estoy cuidando a mi mamá. I'm taking care of my mom. For, desde el 2011. Since 2011. And ahorita mi mamá ya no se puede hacer nada por ella misma. Y yo tengo que hacer todo por ella, desde cambiarla, llevarla a las citas, moler su comida, dársela en su boca, darle agua. Y pues yo vengo a apoyar a, a todos mis compañeros de aquí de Tulare. Uh, my mom at this time, she, she cannot do anything by her own, on her own. And I have to provide everything for her, feed her, change her, uh, bathe her and uh, feed her, in, I mean, uh, hand feed her. And I'm here to support my uh, uh, companions too. Y también, pues, exigiendo un justo salario que sería decente para poder vivir nosotros. Este, yo ahorita no puedo ir a trabajar a otros tulares, a otros condados donde tienen las, uh, los beneficios que nosotros no tenemos. And I just, I'm just here uh, demanding um, a just wage, uh, um, like uh, because I cannot go and uh, work in other places, uh, like they have um, um, good pay and benefits, because I have to take care of my mom. Y pues solo vengo este para pedirles que pues nos ayuden con los uh, los uh, los servicios médicos. Y un justo salario para poder vivir. And I'm just here to ask you for a just salary and uh, for health, me uh, for medical uh, benefit, health care benefits, uh, so we can survive uh, like a decent um, person. Pues eso es todo lo que yo vengo a, de a decirles y apoyar a mis compañeros y muchas gracias. And that's all I came to, to, to tell you and I'm here to support my union and thank you very much. Thank you, Jovita. Ramona Flores. Muy buenos días. Mi nombre es Ramona Flores. Good morning. My name is Ramona Flores. Uh, yo vengo para, uh, porque estoy, estoy, tuve que moverme de condado a trabajar, manejo Tengo dos años trabajando en Ruili por, uh, por la, la aseguranza que tienen mejores salarios en, en Fresno y estando tan cerca de Baicelia, no sé por qué, este, no es justo. Nosotros trabajamos, pues todas mis compañeras tienen diferentes uh, trabajos con sus familias, pero es la misma causa que, que, que vengo a, a, a pedirles para... Um, para poder vivir mejor. Um, just wanted to tell you that I had to start working in another county, at Fresno County in Ridley, uh, to be able to get um, a be better benefits and a better pay. Uh, and I have to drive two hours every day. And I don't understand why I cannot work here. And, and because I'm doing the same uh, job that my um, other um, uh, friends are doing, and, get it, and they're getting a better pay, uh, and it's just very close from here. Um, that's, that's all. Sí, por favor, este, 
porque el, eh, lo que gano, poquito más que gano allá, pero lo termino gastando en el, en el, en el, en el gas, combustible, llantas y, y todo. Entonces, este, el tiempo también, que se requiere llegar más temprano, irme más temprano para poder uh, hacer mi trabajo. Entonces, este, por favor, este, les suplico que, que nos ayuden en, en aumentarme el sueldo y tener uh, mejores, mejor, pues mejor salario y, y seguro médicos para todas las familias, para todos mis compañeros, por favor. Muchas gracias. Um, every day I have to drive, uh, I'm, I'm spending a lot of money in gas and wear and tear of my car. So I'm uh, asking to, um, to please um, uh, take care of um, uh, our salary, get it, give us a better salary and, and benefits like other counties have. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Julian, Juliana Trejos? Hello, my name is Juliana Trejos, and I'm here today on behalf of my co-workers to ask Dennis Townsend to provide a fair livable uh, wages to IHSS providers. Uh, we are essential workers, and some of our um, clients or consumers depend 100% on this kind of services we do. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Anonymous. Good morning, I'm here to support the SEIU. Um, I understand that they are asking for more money. Where there's a will, there's a way. This county is flush with money coming from the state and federal. Um, I believe that if you can give yourself a raise and that's okay to do, then maybe you could find the will to give these very hardworking necessary frontline basically um, to do with COVID. I mean, they are, they're at risk also. I, I think these people deserve more money and benefits as any other health worker does. So I'm here to support that you have the will and find a way to get these people what they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anybody else in the chambers <clears throat> who'd like to speak for public comment? Come forward. Hello, Hi. my name is Alva Rodriguez. I'm from Fresno, and we currently are getting 14.60 an hour. Um, the reason I am with the union is because I believe we have a purpose here. And because I started working with IHSS in 2011, I started working with my mom and she had Alzheimer's. That is not my, generally my job as an IHSS worker provider, but she did have, come down with Alzheimer's. I currently have a father-in-law who just has dementia, we do not have them on IHSS because the income is too much. But the factors are that as in-home care providers, they're drivers, they're people who are caretakers, they're in the home, cleaning the home. I just currently quit working with the lady that also believed that we were housekeepers. We are not housekeepers because they make more than $14 an hour, okay? But she did, you know, currently said, you know what, there's a spot right there and I had to actually tell her that I am not, for the third time, I'm not her housekeeper. She thought I was Uber, so she'd have me take her to the store. So it was something that I believe if you are an IHSS worker and you are working with somebody, it, you have to give it your full time. It's like basically you're sitting here and you're watching them. And it's not until you sit there and you're watching your father, your mother, or a, a relative, and you have to quit your full time job. Because like I said, I'm not an IHS worker, I was a director for daycare, children, schools, teachers. So basically, doing an IHS work is not something that is easy. It was one of the hardest jobs that I had to do because currently it wasn't just one job. It's seen, they're saying, you know what, I'm taking care of this person, they're getting out of the hospital, you're just sitting there. Because that person is gonna sit there and get out of the chair and you're gonna have to pick them up. You're gonna have to weigh your body toward them and make sure that they go to the restroom. And sometimes you have to change a diaper. It's not like a child, a baby, it's an adult. So basically when we're looking at their wages and we're not making enough, because when I, do the, when, I, when I start talking numbers and we're saying, okay, you're gonna put them in a nursing home and it's over 10,000, you have the person that's cleaning the room, the person that's the CNA, you have the nurse that's getting paid, you have the people in the front desk. There's four salaries right there. This in-home care work 
is just one salary, and it's $14. So I believe if it's, you guys are able to give them and you guys have that in your budget, that it should be able to be put into that process. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Any other buddy here to speak for public comment? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Anna Villegas. Um, I've been a provider for my husband for 30 plus years. We were married one year when he got shot. I'm the one who takes care of him. I'm the one who drives him to the doctor. I'm the one who wipes his butt. I hate to be so blunt, but to see you guys looking at your computers and not looking at all of us, it just hurts me that I have to beg you for a pay raise. I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm a doctor, I'm a nurse, I'm, a, I'm everything. And for us to be in Tulare County and see our surrounding counties care more for their, provi for their providers is humiliating. And to this point, I'm willing to move to Fresno where I, can he I hear that they care about them. And you, Tulare County, are with your little gifts from other people, it's, it's just a, a stab in, in our back. And for this young man right here, just all of you guys are, are in your computers. Look at us. Look at what we're going through to come here. I had to wake up my husband at 6 in the morning to, sh to get him out of bed, to shower him, to dress him, to put him in his wheelchair, to feed him, to come here and give you my point of view. It isn't fair. It isn't fair at all. That's all I had to say. Thank you for your comments. Do we have anybody else who would like to speak? Okay. Seeing none, Madam, Ch Madam Clerk, do we have any phone callers? Yes, we do. Okay. Good morning, thank you for holding. You're now connected to the board meeting. Please state your name and address for the record. Your three minutes will begin now. Hi, yes, my name is Josephine Arenas and I live in Pauper, California. And my address, you guys want my physical address? Just your city's fine. Okay. Hi, yes, I'm calling today just to ask Dennis Townsend to support in-home support services providers <clears throat> we are not getting the fair livable wages we are falling behind compared to all the other counties and also have one more thing dennis um us as providers we do work the same thing as other providers in different counties we do the exactly same thing please hear our voice in this thank you very much thank you all the calls that concludes public comment okay uh any other public comments mr chat like chat <laughs> i think we're ready chad if you'd like to approach the podium i'm here on a totally unrelated issue but I do sympathize with the people here. I had to take care of my parents for two years. I took uh, two years off work, but in my situation, financially, I was able to handle it. I was able to even be able to pay close to half a million dollars in medical care that, you know, for extra equipment and all that stuff. But it, it is a hard job. It's really hard to take care of your parents change diapers and things of that nature, but I applaud those people. That's a great job that they do. Okay, well, <clears throat> the reason I'm here today is I would like to request a um, board member to instruct the staff to set up a, um, oh, I'm sorry, I need to come down from that a little bit. The matter to be set on the agenda. 
I need to address the board, and I can't do it in a matter of three minutes. Uh, this is in regards to RMA actions. We've been going back and forth for many, many years. Uh, it has come to the boil, and um, we need to take care of this. So if you can please give me a chance to address the board and have RMA to rebut to my complaints and allegations. If you could do that, I would appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chad. You have a nice day. Tammy, could you step out with Mr. Tafty and get his information, please, phone number and all? We could contact him. Thank you. Okay, that's it for public comment. Moving right along, we are now at our consent calendar. These items are routine and usually approved by one motion. I'm going to ask if there are any uh, board members that would like to pull anything from the consent calendar. Yes. All right. Regarding agenda item 12. Okay. Our consideration of a request from the Health and Human Services Agency to enter into an agreement with Proteus Inc. to administer the Housing for Harvest program. I serve as an unpaid member of the Board of Directors of Proteus, a nonprofit public interest corporation. Although I don't have a direct financial conflict of interest, I will abstain from voting on this item to avoid any appearance of conflict of interest. The clerk is requested to make this announcement part of the official record of today's meeting for this agenda item. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, um, Madam Chair, I I wasn't going to pull that, but I was going to comment on the same one. Sure. Can I do it now? Yeah. Okay. All right. I was just going to say that uh, this housing for the harvest, this came up uh, er early on uh, during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, as we identified that there were uh, the farm, farm workers out in the fields that really didn't have a plan B, uh, being able just to take some time off and some didn't have the ability uh, to go to a place where they could be away from uh, larger groups of people and, and even family members. And so I know we, uh, I, I had supported uh, doing a program similar to this where we can get them a place uh, to stay. The board had supported that and advocated for that and then several agencies around the state did it. And so even though it was probably months later than we would have liked to see it coming, um, I think it was a good thing and I think it has really helped in the county. So I just wanted to give some kudos to this particular line item. Is that a motion? Uh, yeah, I'll move to approve it. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> we have a motion by Supervisor Townsend. With a second by Supervisor Vanderpool, please cast your votes. Motion passes four, one, uh, Valero abstain. Uh, yes, that was, that was the first one. The one that he abstained from. And now Madam I will entertain. Madam Chair, I would, entertain, I would uh, make a motion to approve the balance of the consent calendar, less item 20, which has already been addressed. Uh, if there's no further comment by board members or members of the public. Okay, we have a motion. Whoops, I did not move to do that. But I guess it doesn't matter. Please. Okay, there we go, Pete. Motion by Vanderpool, second by Macari. Please cast your votes. Motion passes 5-0. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, moving along to our untimed items. We have quite a few here today. Let me get on my page. Really quick. Um, because I did say that I, I wasn't voting on the item 20, but I did click abstain. Is that still okay? That's yeah, fine. okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, our first item, number 34, is a request from the General Services Agency to approve a master lease purchase agreement with. Bank of America. Good morning, Mrs. Sisk. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Britt, Ms. Flores, and Mr. Kuhn. I'm Brooke Sisk, General Services Agency Director, and I'm going to introduce item number 34, which is a request to approve a master equipment lease purchase agreement with Bank of America. During this presentation, I will provide an introduction and background of the item, then our Fire Chief Charlie Norman will provide more details 
uh, about the fire department's current fleet and the equipment they intend to purchase should this item be approved. Then Bobby Chung, the county's financial advisor from KNN Public Finance, will discuss the debt affordability and impact on the financing on the county's financial position. And lastly, I will conclude with the requested action. So what is a master equipment lease purchase agreement? Basically, this is an opportunity for the county to finance the purchase of vehicles and equipment at very low interest rates and flexible payment terms. The county would have the option to utilize this mechanism essentially as a line of credit that can be requested on an as needed basis. Today's proposal is to utilize this agreement to borrow funds for new fire trucks and apparatus, and we plan to return in the near future with a proposal to finance energy efficiency <coughs> upgrades at multiple county owned facilities. You may ask why is GSA bringing this item forward? It is because the GSA director also doubles as the purchasing agent and the purchasing agent will be the administrator to request the funds from Bank of America. But I must say it has been a collaborative team effort and included significant contributions from the CAO's office, county council, and our contracted advisor from KNN and bond council, as well as the fire department. So now I will turn it over to Chief Norman, who will tell you more about his fleet needs. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Madam Chief. Chair, Vice Chair, members of the board, Jason, County Council, Melinda, how you doing? Good. Um, there was a lot of work to get us here today, and I really appreciate your consideration of this item. As we look through these things, um, and just for uh, uh, government 101, fire trucks have ladders on the top, fire engines have ladders on the side. So, and we'll save that, and um, would we, if we're successful in this venture, we'll all have the opportunity to climb the 110-foot aerial. So, awesome. Uh, currently, um, we, our apparatus sits at about 67. We have an average fleet age of about 20 years, and we're looking at an average annual maintenance budget of about 635. Um, looking at these, um, they are very expensive. It seems like um, engines are expensive, or water tenders, not so much, or just kind of a mobile hydrant system, but you get to the aerial apparatus, and it seems like at about that 12 to 13 mark, and I'll go into an FPA replacement briefly, but you get to about that 12 year mark and they start 50, 60, 70,000 in you to death because the torque boxes fail, uh, the bull gear bolts, there's just some equipment on there. We've had uh, one of our aerial apparatus that's been at Burton's for an extended period of time. Um, on the fortunate side of that, we do have great cooperating agencies who were able to interchange apparatus, but those things do become very expensive. Um, over the past few years, thank you very much, uh, the county has invested 33.4 million for an average uh, apparatus of about 1.7 per year. But currently we're using Spartan fire apparatus. Previously we used Rosenbauer, um, not so much with the spec as you look at various apparatus. Pierce, uh, City of Visalia uses those all the time. And you look at service after the sale, you look at uh, uh, Pierce has some very big proprietary issues maybe a great car, maybe a Cadillac, but when you have to replace a gauge letter, or later in the apparatus replacement, you have to go to the factory to do that. So very nice, but again, from a long-term standpoint, very cost prohibitive. Um, NAP 1900 uh, sort of sets a standard for apparatus and what we keep. Uh, frontline apparatus, uh, normally about an industry standard of about 10 years. We're currently at 20. Reserve apparatus is about 15. We're currently at 29. Um, we do, and I don't want to make this sound like negative complaining, but uh, we have uh, several apparatus, 11 that are over 20 and seven that are greater than 30 years old. We do have uh, five 1986, 1987 Becks and then we have one 1982 Beck. Those are great, they're pre-computer, but they've just kind of outlived their useful shelf life. Um, we had one up uh, on a training venture the other day. It looked great, um, ran, uh, didn't overheat, but it is very, very uh, cumbersome and very cost prohibitive. 
As we look at uh, right-sizing our fleet, uh, looking at our apparatus, you can't come in with a hard standard that every station has a ladder truck, an engine, a water tender, and a patrol. You have to look at the geographic diversity, the population diversity, as well as the call volume for the area. So in order to get us to a more appropriate manageable fleet management, we're trying to reduce the right size of the fleet to 41 apparatus. This will help us in reducing the average age of the fleet um, with frontline engines no more than 15 years, our reserves no more than 20, and with that comes into play this uh, purchase of 11 apparatus. Uh, this will uh, secure a warranty plan. Uh, this was one of the apparatus EVEG was uh, the um, uh, five-year warranty plan and can create a consistent platform for all firefighter and civilian safety. We're a large outfit. We've had some very large incidents over the last four or five years. Um, operational readiness is our number one priority. Um, increasing, in summary, increasing operational efficiency and standardization. We have people that work a, a vast amount of stations. We want to make sure that, and it's hard to standardize with a large outfit as ourselves, but uh, as close as we can get to standardization, the better off and the safer we're going to be. Decreasing the apparatus downtime. As much as our, our shop does a good job for us, it's just when you have old equipment, it systematically breaks. And we, it's the, the downtime coupled with having to re-machine parts, especially on our aerial apparatus, um, becomes very time sensitive also. Provide for obviously, we're here for public safety. We wanna make sure everybody's safe in all our mountain communities and all our civilian and our Valley floor communities. And then meeting a general pathway NFPA is a recommendation. We want to make sure that we're complying with NFPA recommendations. There's some NFPA standards that are um, we're going to be unable to meet, but apparatus replacement should be one of those to where we have good standardized apparatus. Um, kind of, and again, in summary, these are constructed in Brandon, South Dakota. Uh, the five-year warranty, uh, we had no warranty with Rosenbauer. The uh, Burton's was our shop we used out of Modesto. This will have a mobile mechanic service to it. Uh, their primary shop is out of Anaheim. Um, with the rapid deployment extrication turntables, which will also help us in stepping towards our extrication equipment replacement. Uh, we look at this will cover a vast array of stations in all political districts. Um, we're looking at our current order. So we're looking at uh, type threes in about 12 months. From, we'll do pre-construction next month. We have several specs that are ready to go. The one with a tension, the tactical water tender, we'll have to work on that. But we're looking at three engine deliveries in August of next year, July or August. We'll look at two type threes and two type ones in September, October, about 14 months, along with our second aerial. And then the three tactical uh, tensions, about 16 months. So we should have these complete and in service by the end of next year, the end of 2022. Um, as, and as we've talked about, and I think you've heard from the annual report, uh, the chicken and the egg. Some of our stations are, were built in the 40s, built in the 50s. Will this fit? All of these apparatus, I'm not knocking on wood, but <laughs> we've gone out and physically measured all the stations. In the future, we're going to have to do some reconstruction with Station 7 in Goshen and Station 16 in Strathmore. But existing fleet, and as we develop down the road, uh, five, six, seven years, we're going to have to do some station. But those are our two uh, major garages that need refurbishing. So. I want to thank all of you for listening. I appreciate um, everything and all your commitment to public safety. Uh, CAO office and staff, as well as Nancy Renovato from my office, has been uh, tremendous. Uh, Brooke staff, um, the Bond Council. As you get into the Bond Council, and it's uh, more in your ear than mine, I'm scratching my head and I'm going, what did he say? That, that was pretty interesting. He does not speak firefighter. Uh, County Council has always been good. And then Mr. Grinstead from Emergency Vehicle Group. Um, that's it. Uh, try and make it as quick as I can. Um, that is all I have. Um, answer any questions or I can wait until the end. Any questions so far? Okay, thank you, Chief Norman. And now I'm going to turn it over to Bobby Chung from KNN Public Finance, who is joining us via Zoom. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, are you able to hear me okay? Yes. Great, great. Um, well, uh, my name is Bobby Chung, and I'm with KN Public Finance, uh, the county's uh, municipal financial advisor. Um, it's good to speak before your board again. Uh, it's been a while. Um, as a quick reminder, uh, it's my job to help 
um, you know, represent the county's interests when corresponding with the debt markets uh, and help you, the board, uh, and staff to make uh, informed financial decisions regarding borrowings or potential borrowings. Uh, so whenever your board, um, you know, is asked to consider um, incurring debt, uh, you know, you do so in a thoughtful uh, and measured way. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, are folks going to advance the slides or, or um, am I? Okay, good. I'm able to control that. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about debt affordability rating agency metrics, uh, the impact of uh, this fire equipment uh, and also um, uh, an upcoming energy project uh, upon your uh, the county's debt ratios and talk a little bit uh, about the plan of finance. Uh, so I'll start off uh, by talking a little bit about our approach to looking at the concept of debt affordability and how it relates to uh, your equipment financing. And uh, uh, it's required uh, under the county's adopted debt policy. And really it boils down to two uh, kind of key approaches. Number one, uh, there's this concept of market capacity, uh, you know, what the bond market and the debt markets will allow you to borrow. And number two, uh, budgetary capacity. You know, obviously that's, that's your realm as the board, finding the room in the county budget to actually be able to, to service the debt and, and make these payments. Uh, so, so our approach um, is from the market approach and our perspective is from that of, um, you know, particularly uh, the credit rating agencies. Uh, so Standard & Poor's um, uh, uh, it publishes uh, their rating criteria, and uh, this slide shows uh, their approach to evaluating credit. Uh, so S&P uh, maintains uh, a rating for the county right now on your pension obligation bonds. Uh, that rating is uh, AA-, minus, which is very good. Um, and part of this exercise is, is trying to see if incurring more debt uh, would negatively impact your rating. Uh, obviously, that's something we would want to uh, want to avoid. Uh, and so, uh, you know, very briefly here, uh, we see on this page the different buckets uh, that go into the county's rating. Uh, the three blue boxes being uh, institutional framework, uh, which is the county's relationship to the state of California. Uh, the economy comprises 30% of the rating. Uh, um, let's see, uh, management practices is 20%. Uh, and the green boxes show financial measures at 30%, which is liquidity, budgetary performance, <laughs> budgetary flexibility. Uh, and finally, 10% uh, of uh, debt and contingent liabilities. Uh, all of these factors feed into an initial rating. Uh, there's some overriding factors that the rating analysts supply, and then that um, spits out uh, your, your, your final uh, rating. Uh, so basically, uh, standard and poor's, uh, each one of these credit buckets um, is then assigned a, a numeric score with uh, one being very strong, and five being very weak. Uh, all of those buckets are weighted uh, to produce a long-term rating. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you're a double A minus right here. Uh, so, um, you know, your, your weighted score uh, is producing this credit rating. Uh, so, um, we at k &N have developed this debt affordability model uh, to calculate each one of these ratios uh, uh, that S&P has identified in their criteria. And then what we do is we layer on uh, new debt uh, to see how, uh, if at all, uh, the new debt impacts uh, your scoring. Uh, so we always begin with looking at where you are now, right? Um, the county currently has two major um, uh, debt issuance outstanding, uh, long-term debt issuances, uh, the 2018 uh, taxable POBs, the pension obligation bonds, and also the 2006 uh, Millennium Fund uh, lease obligations. Uh, and this slide uh, summarizes the county's existing uh, two debt ratios. So this is before um, uh, you know, uh, the leases that we're considering today. Uh, this first debt ratio, net direct debt as a percentage of total governmental funds revenue, which is basically all of the par amount outstanding as a percentage of one year's revenue uh, along the top box uh, on the right here, if you can see um, my, my cursor. And along the, the left side here, 
uh, total governmental funds debt service as a percentage of total governmental funds expenditures, basically your carrying charge. Um, and based on the most uh, uh, recent fiscal year's data, uh, you scored a one uh, in both of these categories, um, uh, which is less than 30% for this top ratio and less than 8% for this second ratio. Um, you can see, however, in fiscal 19, this, the county scored a two uh, for this first ratio because it was just over 30%. Now, remember, that's still considered to be uh, strong uh, based on the rating criteria. And uh, the reality is the county's pension obligation bonds amortize a lot of principal each year, um, about 10 million this June. So the par amount outstanding metric uh, gets stronger uh, as you pay down uh, debt. Uh, so then we look at the impact of uh, potential uh, additional debt. Um, so now we're really getting uh, you know, to the point of, of why we're here today. Uh, you know, what's the impact of layering on an additional 8.7 million of fire equipment uh, that amortizes over five years uh, and potentially another 9 million of solar lease projects that amortize over 20 years? Um, you know, if there were other borrowings on the radar that the county is considering, um, you know, that should also get baked into this uh, analysis as well. Um, so we've made a couple of key assumptions in the forward-looking scenarios uh, of the model, uh, basically 3% growth in revenues and expenditures and uh, no offsetting revenues or efficiencies uh, that are a result of the projects. Uh, this next slide has a lot of numbers on it, uh, but it summarizes the forecasted impacts of the two leases uh, on the two debt ratios that, that uh, I was just talking about earlier. Uh, so in orange, uh, in the top box, you see estimated debt service uh, for the fire equipment energy project lease. Uh, the carrying charge ratio uh, increases from about 2.5% to 2.7%, uh, so a moderate increase, uh, but great increase, uh, but nowhere near um, the 8% threshold that would bump you to a two. Uh, so you're projected to comfortably stay in the scoring uh, of one uh, for this ratio. Uh, the lower box is the par amount ratio. Uh, and you see the fire lease uh, uh, coming in in fiscal 21 and uh, potentially the energy lease in fiscal 22. Um, you know, right now, as I mentioned, you're just under 30%. Um, and even with the addition of the new fire lease in the current fiscal year, uh, we think you'll stay under that 30% ratio, um, you know, because you're paying off more than 10 million uh, of your pension obligation bonds this fiscal year. Uh, and the same thing is happening uh, in, in the next fiscal year with the energy lease. Um, so the bottom line is, um, you know, literally, uh, we think, um, you know, based on um, this set of assumptions that uh, you're likely to stay in the very strong category uh, for the debt ratios. Um, so a couple of conclusions here, um, you know, the county uh, could issue both leases without adversely impacting uh, your uh, very strong scoring. Um, but again, this analysis looks at just uh, these two ratios, um, you know, while we're trying to uh, estimate what the rating agencies would look uh, and, and, and think like uh, we're not actually rating analysts ourselves. Uh, so our analysis assumes that other factors, uh, you know, stay constant, such as the economy, um, you know, other costs, uh, reserves, etc. Um, and obviously, while I can provide the market's perspective on affordability, uh, it's the board's decision to make budgetary trade-offs uh, necessary to pay back the debt. Um, okay, and uh, my last slide here. Um, is uh, just a little bit more about the program itself uh, before your uh, consideration. Um, you know, as folks uh, have mentioned, this is a master equipment lease program uh, from Bank of America. Um, this is set up as a master program. So instead of, uh, you know, either going uh, to individual vendors each time there's a need, uh, you can access this program uh, fairly efficiently. Um, and the plan is that the bank will have a conversation with staff each year to establish a um, maximum borrowing amount for the year, uh, which the county uh, may or may not use, uh, and there's no fee for unutilized capacity. Um, the equipment itself serves as the least asset uh, for the borrowing. 
um, this would be you know fixed uh, fixed interest rate uh, is set at the time of each borrowing, uh, and the financing term is flexible, uh, anywhere from three years uh, all the way up to uh, you know potentially as long as twenty years, um, if desired. Uh, the current indicative rate for the five year fire equipment financing lease is uh, 1.185%, uh, which is fairly low. Uh, I think the last vendor financing option we saw was um, you know, well over twice that amount uh, in, in terms of interest rate. Uh, and finally, uh, just on the bottom of this page, uh, you see a chart of the long-term interest rates since, um, since 2010. Uh, we saw a bit of volatility last spring um, you know, when COVID hit. Uh, hit the financial markets, um, but the markets have recovered, and uh, overall rates are at uh, fairly low levels uh, when looking back uh, over this time frame. Um, so that's about it for me. Um, I'll pause to see if there are any uh, questions at this point. Madam Chair, um, Bobby, thank you for the presentation. Uh, great to hear you. Uh, uh, making these presentations to the county, talking about our financial position, and we are in a very strong position and don't want to do anything that's going to jeopardize that um, going forward. Um, looking at the overall rating, uh, AA minus, uh, now that we're dipping below 30, do you think, 30%, do you think that we will uh, have an upgrade in our rating, or do you think we will still stay at the AA minus? Well, that's, uh, that's a good question, Supervisor. Um, when this rating was established uh, uh, in, in the context of your pension obligation bonds, yeah. um, you know, it, 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 um, you were uh, at uh, the strong level. So you were scoring a two. Uh, so, so this one metric has actually improved, um, you know, since 2018. Yeah. Um, to be frank with you, I, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, the next time, um, at least S&P does a review of the county's rating, we would certainly point this out um, uh, as, as a strength um, uh, contributing factor to your rating. Yeah, and, and I don't know that it really matters for the purposes of the rate for this uh, particular uh, debt issuance, but um, you know, maybe for future borrowings, if it were to come up, uh, uh, that improvement should be highlighted because it usually would result in a better interest rate in general. Uh, not saying that uh, it would in particular, because we're actually at a pretty good rate for a government entity right now. Um, is there a prepayment penalty for uh, this vehicle or not for the this investment uh, mechanism or debt mechanism? You know, that's a good question. I, I think this is a prepayable with no penalty after a half of the term. So, um, you know, for the five-year term, it would be after two and a half years. You, you know, um, I, it I'll, just, it, it seems like there's money falling out of the sky fairly regularly lately. And uh, I just want to make sure that if we find ourselves in a position where we can prepay, um, we're not penalized for doing so. Uh, that, that's it for me for uh, questions for... Uh, Uh, very informative. I, I may have missed it. You, I probably, uh, you might have went right by it, but uh, assumptions uh, that we use for the uh, revenues for the county over the next several years in those models, what, what were the assumptions? Uh, we just used a, a blanket 3% growth on both the revenues and the expenditures. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Chung. And I'm going to conclude with the requested actions. Um, due to some last minute changes to the agenda item, I'm going to read them all into the record. Um, first request is to approve the master equipment lease purchase agreement with Bank, B-A-N-C, of America Public Capital Corporation for lease purchase acquisition of county vehicles and equipment and all associated documents, including the attached resolution. Two, approve a capital lease agreement per equipment schedule number one of the master equipment lease purchase agreement for the acquisition, financing, and leasing of listed vehicles and equipment for Tulare County Fire Department in an amount not to exceed $9,033,088.10. Three, authorize prepayment of the purchase price for the fire department's vehicles and equipment to Emergency Vehicle Group, Inc., 
and four, authorize the chair of the board to sign the master equipment lease purchase agreement and the purchasing agent or designee to sign all associated documents. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or defer to consultants and others um, that you may have. Thank you. All right. Do we have any other questions for Brooks? Just, just a general comment. I think uh, you know we've talked about this for a while, uh, doing this and using a mechanism to invest in our fire department, uh, and really is an investment in public safety here in the county. Um, I, you know, couldn't be happier to uh, uh, help the chief. You know, looking at these uh, uh, vehicles, he's complaining about uh, vehicles from 1982. Not, not 84 yet, I mean, that was my birthday, but don't, don't start saying that that's starting to get too old because that might get offensive. But, uh, um, you know, we, we do have uh, an older vehicle fleet and it's good that we're able to uh, take on this huge amount of vehicle replacement all at once. Uh, this will make a dent uh, in improving the overall uh, vehicle uh, average age, but, you know, it still gives us work to do. Um, and, you know, I think it's a, a down payment and a good faith gesture to the fire department in, in showing that we want to make sure that they're outfitted with the best uh, technology that, that is available so that they can best serve our public and keep our community safe. So I really do appreciate them being a good team player and making uh, do with the resources available uh, for them uh, and look forward to uh, the benefits that will be provided by these vehicles. So thank you, Chief. and. Uh, Appreciate all your efforts in putting this plan together. Supervisor McCarry. I'd just like to thank Brooke and Chief Norman and, and Jason uh, for your efforts on this. You know, it, it's interesting that, that I'm seeing equipment on the road that when I first started is still out there. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think when the county, cha when they changed to Cal Fire, I mean, from Cal Fire to County Fire, that um, the, and they did that for a, a reasonable purpose, but we need to invest, and it should have been a long-term investment in, in our equipment because that stuff does uh, expire, and we end up spending more in maintenance. So I fully support this project, and I want to thank you for your time. Supervisor Townsend, I apologize. I thought that was from last time. <laughs> That's okay. I knew I could hit the button again, so it's all right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Charlie, for the uh, presentation, and I said uh, Bobby already. And, you know, uh, when somebody asks about, you know, what, what's government, you know, what's our, what's our priority? Right at the top of the priority is public safety in government. But unfortunately, a lot of times we don't have the money to spend, you know, to, uh, to buy the equipment uh, that are, that's necessary and even for personnel that are necessary. So it's really nice to be able to take advantage of this little moment in time and this financing opportunity and mechanism uh, to be able to make a difference there. So really supportive of this. Thanks for bringing it forward. Supervisor Valero. And I'll be brief. So I just want to share that this is a huge uh, improvement to the safety and security of the people of Tulare County. And I think the fire department has waited long enough for this request and happy to move this forward. Thank you for all the work that you all have done in order to bring this forward. Mr. Britt. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, Jason Britt, County Minister. Um, yeah, thank, thank you to the chief and all the staff who really put this together. I just want to just summarize the end that this is 11 vehicles. Um, I believe all of them with extrication equipment, or at least the vast majority of them, so that they come well equipped. Um, interest rate of 1.1850, I'm not sure. I guess other than zero, I don't know how much better um, it could get. Um, and this also demonstrates, uh, for the last three years, we've been investing about 1.7 million. This payment will be about 1.8. So this just allows us to accelerate uh, getting the, the purchase of the equipment and use it. And after the five years, still have a, a long, useful life. And so um, this, was, um, this has been uh, many months in the making. <laughs> so I do wanna appreciate uh, the board Council, GSA, Fire, um, Auditor, everyone for making this happen. Um, this is a, a good day for our fire department and it uh, gets us a little bit further down the road than we uh, would have had been. And I just want to appreciate everyone's uh, time and effort that they've put into this um, program. And Bobby from k and <laughs> All right, is there any public comment on this matter? Any phone calls? No. 
Okay. Uh, I, too, want to congratulate you and thank you, Charlie. As, as uh, the CAO said, we're already putting out about 1.7 uh, on this, and for just a little more, we get a whole new fleet, and we don't have to do the, the spinning plates. You know, by the time you get to the last one, you got to run back and, and take care of it. And, um, of course, with this board, public safety is of the utmost importance. We want to make sure that when a call comes in, our trucks and our engines make it to, I know the difference, Charlie, uh, make it to where they need to go. Um, so with that, I will entertain a motion. Okay, we have a motion by Supervisor Valero with a second by Supervisor Townsend. Please cast your votes. Motion passes 5-0. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, before we move on to the next item, we are going to take a five-minute break, so we'll be back in here at 10.51. Turn around.
All right, thank you folks. We are back. Uh, we are on item number 35, which is a request from the Sheriff's Department to approve an agreement with the aircraft dealer Van Bortel Aircraft Inc. for the purchase of one six-seat 2004 Cessna T-206 aircraft and under Sheriff Sigley. I'll let you explain the rest. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, Chairwoman, Board, Council, CAO. First off, congratulations, Charlie. She's turned that fire department and brought it into the 21st century, so that's well done. Um, today, this agenda item before you is, um, as you recall, back in 2017, uh, the Sheriff's Office purchased two aircraft, a Cessna 182 and a Cessna 206. Um, what we found during our last three to four years of operation is the weight limitation on our 182. Um, I think it was 2019 we purchased a little over half a million dollar FLIR uh, camera equipment system for the 206. And what we're looking to do is have the ability to, without having to come back to you guys asking for another 800,000 to put a different camera on that 182 that would uh, allow us to have two people in it as well as it's, it's basically about the weight load. So we've been working on this a little over a year. Uh, the crux of it is it's a, it's a mere aircraft of our larger aircraft, the 206, including in the board agenda item is funding for uh, the mounting brackets. So as in a situation we're in right now, our aircraft, our 206 is down south. It's been down there for five weeks, getting that new radio put in it. And we've been down because we don't have a camera for the 182. So what we wanted to do in, uh, is have the ability, because those cameras and the radio system that are being installed, the camera's already installed, but is unplug it and plug it into the other one and we're back up. With the 182, we cannot do that. Uh, some concerns you might have is, well, why are we taking a newer 2017 and trading it for an 04? Uh, you can't think of it as you would a car. Uh, FAA regulates after so many hours, those airplanes have to be rebuilt. Uh, we don't have a choice in the matter. Um, right now our 182 is 100 hours less than the aircraft we're trading across for. So we currently have 641.6 hours on our 182. This 206, this 04 206 has 757. So it's essentially a brand new aircraft. Um, the weight capability is the big difference, the fuel. We can carry more fuel with the 206. We can carry more load, which includes our TFO, our equipment, our camera. Um, and just to give you kind of a a recap of our air operations um, since we instilled this. We've had 4,189 calls for service with that aircraft since we've uh, purchased them and been airborne. And they range from uh, patrol assist, arrest assist, uh, search and rescue, missing person, assisting other agencies, special operations, assisting pursuits, uh, marijuana overflights. Um, so they've been very beneficial as far as keeping our boots on the ground safe. Uh, the warranty on this trade is uh, it's kind of broken into three, three different sections. It's based off days or hours. So it goes from 60 days or 30 flight hours, 180 days, 60 flight hours, 365 days or 100 flight hours. And it just kind of is prorated based off at, at any point during that time within those parameters. We don't like the aircraft, we want to take it back, we can take it back. If they have not sold the 182, that kind of figures in too, we can get that back or cash in lieu. Um, one of the, the big positives why our aircraft kind of has a, a higher value is one, we have not put any holes in it. <laughs> so we haven't you know, had any brackets put on it, we haven't, as we have the 206. So that's kind of the reason, uh, if I remember right, last time I was up here on this aircraft, I think the 182 we purchased for 580, if I remember right. That's not, probably not tax and everything, but so it, these planes hold their value. Um, so I think that's it, unless you guys have any questions. They will uh, deliver the aircraft to a certified Cessna mechanic at the Fresno, which is the mechanic we use. 
and that's where the inspections will take place on their aircraft. They'll inspect on our aircraft. Once everybody's happy, they'll fly the 182 back, and we'll take possession of the 206 upon your approval. Supervisor Vanderpool? So just a, a quick comment. Uh, thanks for bringing this uh, item to us. Uh, obviously, it's... Uh, uh, it's a concern to you know get rid of uh, you know just on the on the public uh, right. what meets the public. Hey, you're trading in a 2017 for 2004. <laughs> I appreciate you clarifying uh, how planes are aged and rebuilt, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I do think that uh, trading in a 182 for uh, another 206 uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, the, being able to change out the parts uh, between the two planes so that you're not down. Um, that's critical when you say that since you've had the program, you've had over 4,000 uh, calls for service. And I think that that's an important factor as well. We're not just buying planes to buy planes and to have planes. Right. Uh, we're buying planes for use. Um, these planes are being used to serve public safety uh, and keep our community safe and our officers or our deputies safe. So uh, I think that's a, a very important uh, a part of this, and you made a very uh, thorough presentation. So uh, next time you can do it in the Busby outfit, and <laughs> make that the only thing that would make it better, Tom. Thanks. Supervisor uh, Macari. Senator Sheriff, I'd like to thank you for the presentation and having witnessed the benefits of these aircrafts um, and the, accessing the capability and enhancing the capability by having two planes. That's something that I remember we used to strive for. So uh, it's it's great to see that that goal has been achieved and uh, thanks again and I strongly appreciate uh, approve of this uh, project. Is there any public comment on this item? No? Tom, I have a quick question. Educate me. Um, you mentioned like other agencies calling in for assistance. Is that just a mutual aid kind of thing? I mean, we don't right. bill for that city, or? City of Porterville, CHP, if they get in a pursuit, we get in a pursuit. Uh, and, and the plane's up and they're not on priority traffic with us, they'll assist. Okay, cool. All right, so with that, I will entertain a motion. I move for approval. We have a motion by Supervisor Townsend, a second by Supervisor Macari. Please cast your vote. No pushing, no shoving, getting to the button. Uh, motion passes 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. All right, our next item is 36, requests from the Resource Management Agency to approve the 2021-22 County Transportation Improvement Program and direct staff to take appropriate action to implement the program. Good morning once again. Good morning. Reed Schenke with the Resource Management Agency. And once again, I'd like to thank you for the recognition with Public Works Week. Um, the timing here is fantastic as we bring forward to you the County Transportation Improvement Program. This, as a reminder, is our annual proposed package of road and bridge projects that we'll be looking to go uh, forward with starting next year and then into the following couple of years. Um, we lovingly refer to it as the CTIP. Um, there's a lot of information in this presentation, so do feel free to stop me at any point if you've got any questions or if I can provide further clarity. Um, but I will provide a little bit of a background on why we do the CTIP. Um, I did want to go over our general roads revenue and expenditure summary. There's a lot of pieces to that puzzle, um, a lot of different fund sources, and sometimes it gets lost in the noise a little bit with the, the budget process, so I want to take some time to kind of discuss that. Um, and then absolutely cover project specifics, what's in the CTIP, what's in the proposed package this year. Um, so why do we do a CTIP? Ultimately, it's, it's to allow for better planning and prioritization of efforts, and there's so much need out there, we've got to figure out a way to kind of identify projects and then work forward. Some of these projects take two, three, four years to actually go forward. So this is the tool that really, at the county level, allows us to identify those projects and then task staff to, you know, you've got your marching orders, now let's go out and get them done. Um, you've heard of the F-TIP and the state has the S-TIP, so this is kind of our local version of those programs. 
So here's the, the first of a couple slides that really shows um, in numbers uh, how we get the money and where it goes. Um, in the pie here, you can see the, the two biggest pieces, or really the one biggest piece if you put them together, is HUDA and SB1. This for a little over 40% of our roads revenue, this is our gas tax and our vehicle licensing fee taxes. So that's a huge piece of our, our revenue package. Um, Measure R is another large piece of the pie. Uh, that's the local sales tax. Um, without Measure R, we wouldn't A, be able to do a lot of what we do from kind of the, the basic standpoint, but also we're able to utilize Measure R to leverage and to um, match for many of the federal grants, state grants that we are able to take advantage of. So a huge piece there. Uh, federal funds, about a quarter of our revenues. These are generally competitive grant-based awarded uh, projects, um, more often for uh, what I'll call capital improvement type work, so new sidewalks, um, and then bridge replacements also fall under this. But not so much on the federal side for just pure asphalt replacement maintenance type efforts. And then one other piece to, to note is our LTF funds. Uh, about five and a half million is proposed this year. And these are the funds that if unspent on transit and there are no unmet needs in transit, it can kind of fall down to streets and roads. So it's a pretty significant chunk of uh, revenue that we use for streets and roads through that process. Um, total projected revenues for next fiscal year is a, a bit over $68 million. Uh, in a little bit more detail on the gas tax and the vehicle licensing fees portion, um, you can see kind of the trends of where we've been and where we're going. The orange line is what I'll call the legacy HUDA gas tax, so that was prior to SB1. The blue lines is what uh, SB1 added incrementally to that revenue. So you can see this year it's, uh, it's, a, you know, it's not quite double, but it's close to doubling what we had um, if you go back to 15, 16 or so. Um, you can see the trend has been increasing and then we're forecasting a decrease as we go forward into the future. And ultimately that's from vehicles are not using gas as much anymore. We're using electric vehicles, efficiency standards have increased. And so there's a, a generally recognized, uh, I guess, uh, issue here that there will have to be at some point kind of a reckoning of, well, revenues were based on per gallon sold. How do we offset that decrease? So you can see in the next few years, we're projecting uh, a decrease, and that trend is based off of um, kind of forecasted decreases in gasoline sales. So definitely a big plus on SB1, but that didn't really solve the problem as we're looking out into the, say, 10-year future. This table here shows the, the number in our fund balance reserves. So we don't um, really mingle funds with the general fund. So we have to establish our own general fund reserves to cover uh, unexpected costs, et cetera. You can see that line grew to um, a point in about 1819, 1920, where it peaked out um, a little over 40 million. Um, but the, I think the point to take away here is you can see where the two lines split. We've got the blue line and then the orange line. Once we started doing the CTIP, we basically identified funding that was committed now. So um, it takes a couple years and sometimes to actually spend the money once it's been identified. So that's really the number that we're, that we're watching. And that's the, the number that we're trying to aim at around the $10 million point. Um, I'll get into why that number is important in the next slide. But you can see that for some time, the, the fund balance was increasing and we just weren't getting the money out on the roads. And a few years back, we recognized we've got to get the money out. There's no reason to be hanging on to a fund balance in, in that sum. So you can see that um, we're projected and continually going forward, unless we get direction otherwise, um, to hit that $10 million mark with our expenditures. Um, going forward in the future and projections off the chart, you'll start to see that those numbers will, that that line will kind of flatten out in the 10 million range um, for the committed funds. So why is that 10 million kind of number important? 
Um, GFOA recommends about three months of operating expenses to put into your emergency funds. So for in uh, the Rhodes case, that's about $6 million. Many of our projects are done on a reimbursement basis, so you've got to spend it to get it reimbursed. So we need a cash flow amount to basically just keep the, the motor turning. And then uh, about a million dollars for uh, unforeseen capital asset replacements. Uh, just like fire trucks, some of the road equipment can easily be in the quarter to a half a million dollar range. So you can chew up that million dollars real, real, real quickly. So again, the, as last year, kind of the suggested reserve amount is $10 million, and that's what we'll continue to aim for as we program projects. Um, this is a, a new slide for you. We wanted to go back in time and kind of identify how much has actually been spent on road maintenance. So this is our total maintenance expenditures. This includes the potholes, this includes uh, bridge repairs, this includes blading the shoulder when the soils get pushed up, weeding, it, it's everything, it's the full package. So we're at this year projecting um, 64, 65 million dollars. Um, and that's quite a bit higher than prior years. Um, SB1 was a, a big game changer there. You just, you gotta have the money coming in to be able to spend it. And again, we're trying to tick down on that fund balance reserve. So that's why you're seeing the, the 64, $65 million range. Um, total over past years, I think we've done over the past 12 years, about $425 million worth of total road maintenance expenditures. So um, certainly no small dollar amount, but you'll see in the next slide, um, really not enough to you know, make a huge, huge difference in our pavement condition index, which is shown here. So a reminder, PCI, um, it's a scale of one to 100, 100 being perfect, zero being uh, no road at all, basically. But really the kind of the meat of that uh, criteria is from the 40 to about 85 range, um, being poor, fair, and good, as you can see on the chart there. Our current PCI, this is, it's the average of all uh, asphalt or maintained county roads, um, is a 58. So um, we're just on that bubble between poor and fair. Uh, for reference, the statewide PCI average, so it includes Caltrans and cities, is um, as of 2018 was 65. So we're a bit below that, but for counties, we're actually within kind of the range, particularly the more rural counties. Um, generally, the, the PCI will be higher for a more dense, highly populated area. Um, Orange County, I believe, is in the low 70s, for example. So you can kind of see where we fall there. Um, but really the reason I wanted to provide this chart was to show kind of the, the relationship um, of expenditures versus where you would end up on a PCI score. So if you spend our current average expenditure on pavement only, so this is potholes and overlays, this doesn't include bridge replacements, this doesn't include new signals, those sorts of things. So pavement only, asphalt, oil only. Um, we're in about the $40 million, 35 to $40 million range. Um, if you spend that same amount over 10 years, um, today's dollars, then it bumps our PCI up to about, um, what is it, it's about 64 there. So that, at our status quo funding, that kind of drives up our, our PCI score, um, but we're still within that fair range. Um, but the, the benefit of that is that we're kind of on the flat part of the chart, right? So as you move up on the expenditure side, while you're in the flat part, you're driving it over to the right. But if you want to get up into the good score, then the costs really start going up exponentially. So something to be aware of there. The, the other way to look at this is if we want to get to an 86, excellent, and this is more just an academic uh, discussion at this point, um, a very approximate estimate, that's a technical term, um, about a billion dollars to get us there. Um, realistically, if somebody dropped a billion dollars on us, it would throw the markets out of whack, we wouldn't be able to do it all, but that just gives you kind of a sense of where we are with our, our backlog. And that's, this is not a county, a Tulare County issue, this is not a state of California issue, this is the nation, um, we're not outside, we're not outliers here necessarily. But it just gives you a sense when we have conversations about transportation funding, kind of where things fall. 
Um, and I, as an administrator, I don't know that I'd necessarily say we aim for good. You know, it's just there's got to be a, um, a, a, a way to identify what, what is ideal and where you're getting your, your value for your money. So if it just costs way too much, you know, you don't set the sights there. So I think that with our status quo funding, getting it up into that mid-fair range, being fairly consistent with um, other entities around the state, that's a reasonable goal to achieve, actually. Um, we want to have goals to work for, but we want to have goals to achieve. And so if we can get into that 65 range within the next 10 years, I think we're actually doing pretty well. Um, with that, obviously, just about every other probably county department head feels the same way, but um, it's big money. So that kind of gets through a lot of the, the charts and graphs. Do I have any questions at this point before I get into project specifics? Any questions? All right. So as I mentioned, we've got a huge amount of need out there. How do we identify and select projects? Um, it's, it's a mixture, it's a, it's a mixed bag. We use quantitative and qualitative analysis. Um, our pavement management system is key, so our, our inspectors go out and every other year they'll inspect half the roads. So every two years we've fully inspected the roads, given them a condition analysis, given them a PCI score, and we put that into our management system and it kind of spits out uh, where the best way to spend the money is. But in addition to that, we do field inspections, take vehicle counts, take into account safety history, accident history. Um, so that's the quantitative side. The qualitative side is more we've got our complete streets plans, we've got community plans, we're out in the community quite frequently. Um, we want to get the feedback from the residents and hear what they see as an important route or an important issue that we need to address. Um, we take into consideration economic development factors. Farm to market routes, you've heard us talk about that, that's huge. We need to provide access for um, those primary industry drivers within the county so that they can transport their goods and provide the services. Um, and then you've got to keep a little bit of money in reserve in rapid response. So every year we put a little bit of money aside so that when we miss something, we're going to miss something. There's 3,000 miles of roads out there. We get the phone calls. We need to be able to respond to that and provide the service that people are expecting there. So getting into project specifics, I won't go through every one. Certainly, um, they're in your agenda package. I'd be happy to talk more about them offline. Um, for District 1, we've got uh, a number of overlays in various locations. Um, we're programming some community work in Lynn Cove and Cameron Creek, uh, adjacent to Farmersville. Yeah, there we go. Um, one of the, the big projects to, to maybe mention here is we're preparing for a safety and operational improvement project on the Spruce Corridor. Uh, you'll recall prior conversations about uh, State Route 65 and an expressway going in there. Um, because of expenses, that project was ultimately determined to be infeasible. So we need to do something with the Spruce Corridor there. That's a primary north-south connector uh, between the Porterville, Exeter, and Visalia communities. So we're starting design there, and then with Measure Our Funding, we'll be looking at actually constructing that and programming that in the coming years. In District 2, uh, home of the most road miles in the county, uh, we're continuing with our theme of rehabbing the east-west connectors, the avenues. Uh, in prior years, I think we've done a pretty good job connecting 99 to 43. Um, so now we're expanding that as we work north. Um, we're also getting into uh, Aven or Road 140, excuse me, um, and really trying to provide some of those uh, major thoroughfare connectors that are used. Um, we've got a number of safety projects in District 2, um, and we've got two bridge replacements uh, scheduled in the program this year that'll fall within District 2. A lot of canal crossings in District 2. Uh, in District 3, uh, unfortunately not as many road miles, so we don't get to, you know, work as much there as some of the other locations, but certainly no less important. Um, this year the theme will be as the Sequoia Gateway development uh, starts to build out. They're putting in a number of new roads there that aren't on the C-tip because they're developer-funded uh, projects, but we're seeing a lot more activity there, and we will with the uh, 280 Caldwell uh, interchange that's uh, moving forward here. So in this, pro in this one, we're looking at uh, doing some widening and repairs to Shirk south of Caldwell. 
If you'd like to spend more time there, I do have, uh, you know, I know most of the District 3 is in the city limits of Visalia, but I just hope we don't forget there are a lot of avenues to the west uh, between the 198 and 264 that I drove this last weekend are in pretty bad shape. Absolutely. So in the and coming I get, year... I get a lot of calls from the dairymen and farmers out there that, you know, say this is a pretty bad road. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. There's the large chunk of blue off to the... Uh, southwest quadrant there of 99 and south of uh, 198. So we're we're looking at those and we're definitely Thanks. keeping an eye on them. Yeah. The city of Visalia will donate to Supervisor Shuckman's cause. We got enough uh, roads. We got to spend our money on in uh, other areas. Just want to point yeah, that out. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. <clears throat> in District Four, um, big project this year is Road For 64. For my constituents. Uh, is Road 64. Um, this is the, a road widening project in the southwest uh, quadrant of Goshen coming down to 198. Um, with the development that we're going to be seeing in Goshen, that, that corridor right there is going to get a lot of activity. Um, that one's going to actually be constructed next summer here. We're on track for that. Um, talk about that. In District 5, we've got quite a few projects clustered around the, the Porterville Airport and the casino relocation project. So you'll recall we entered into an MOU with the, the tribe there. So part of that is we committed to doing a number of projects, uh, primarily Teapot Dome, West Street, a little bit of Westwood Street there. Um, but again, a, a lot of other uh, locations where we'll be doing uh, some overlays, uh, some safety project work. Um, got some projects in Terrabella, and it's a, not a huge dollar amount, but uh, recognizing the fire, uh, the SQF fire, we know that there's going to be a lot of activity, logging activity on the Balch and Bear Creek loop up in there, so we need to pay attention and put some uh, effort on that, those roadways as well. Um, Non-project or non-district specific projects uh, cover a, a large dollar amount in our program here. Uh, there's five different categories or programs that we hear call countywide projects. This is our chip seal program. Um, we're looking between all five of these over 100 miles of uh, maintenance throughout the county. Um, we've got 600,000 slated for intersection improvement. Um, I've talked about our rapid response, a million there. Um, ADA improvement programs. So this is a requirement as part of the federal ADA laws um, that we go and upgrade uh, existing curb ramps, sidewalks um, throughout the county. So we have to make strides towards that annually. And once again, we'll be doing slurry seals in some of the communities. Real quick, if I could stop you. Um, on the uh, chip seal program, um, maybe if you could just comment a little bit on uh, some of the history there, um, because I know that we were uh, early on, uh, I would say probably 2010, 2011, 2012, right around there, um, the focus was really going in and completely redoing uh, segments of road each year. So. Through that effort, we would get done, I believe it was about 30 miles of road uh, in an entire year. Mm -hmm. It was going to take us 100 years to get uh, to all county roads. So we, we changed the philosophy at that time and, and really have worked more towards improving the drivability of roads. Um, and I know that the chip seal program was kind of one that spun out of that. How is that going in terms of, you know, really touching and, and putting some repair effort down um, that isn't as costly, but still yields a pretty good uh, bang for the buck. Um, I think it's working in particular regards to chip seal. We get 70, 75 miles. Um, that's, chip seal is a, a fantastic maintenance or life extender of the roadways. So if you're doing it on the right roads, it's not going to bring a road back to life, but it's yeah. going to keep it alive. Yeah. So I think that's fantastic. Um, you'll see on the, the overlays, um, we've got upwards of 50 miles in addition to the chip sealed roads, so I think we're getting a lot more done there. Um, and one of the, the new techniques that we're using is kind of the old philosophy was, well, the road's bad, take out the old asphalt, haul it, get rid of it, and then put in new and build that section back up. 
What we're doing now is we're grinding it in place, creating a base for those roadways, and putting new asphalt over the top of it. So you're not losing the value of that added structural section, uh, that added material that we were previously hauling out. So I, th I think we're making strides in the right direction. Good, thank you. Um, I'm trying to think. There was some rubberized asphalt on Road 80. Um, for the high volume roads like that, we typically bring in base, but I believe you're right. We actually brought in a mill, um, and instead of grinding it in place where you've got kind of the equipment train that runs down the road, they picked it up, hauled it to a nearby location, ground it so that it made, met a class two aggregate base specification, and then put that back down. So. Ultimately, you're right. We didn't haul the material off. It was still there. Awesome. Thank you. Um, one thing that I'm kind of interested to get your feedback on, and I'm a little bit excited about, is as part of our ADA program, we'd like to propose a kind of a subsidy program to, for side rock repairs. So uh, as background on this, um, state law requires or puts the onus of maintenance for sidewalks on the property owner which they abut or which they're adjacent to, even though they're within public rights of way. Um, obviously that does or does not get done based on the economics and the, the position of the property owners. Um, a program that's been successfully used in a couple other locations throughout the country is subsidizing up to maybe say 75% of the costs to those property owners. So they would do the work, they would hire the contractor, and we would reimburse them for that cost. So I think it's a win-win in that if it's done at the right locations, um, we're getting new or repaired sidewalk in place. The property owners, it's taking the, um, the liability, the legal liability off of them because now they don't have trip hazards, et cetera. Um, so I, it's not a particularly high amount that we're expecting to do this. I don't know what kind of feedback we'll get from the public if there's interest in it, but um, it is something I kind of like to test the waters with and see what sort of response we get in the coming year. And if I can just add, I'm a strong proponent of this. I've seen uh, several requests come in to me about this. And for example, there's some sidewalk and then it stops and there's dirt and then it goes back to sidewalk. And so having these measures in place to allow for continued work to be done is a great investment. And I wanna thank you for adding this. I jump in there too. Um, Read on that one. So typically when somebody's gonna do a sidewalk just because they're forced to through a building permit process, then they go ahead and have to do it. Um, so if that comes up, somebody's doing an improvement and then they're told they have to put it in, would we still be able to do the reimbursement? That's something that I could welcome your feedback on. I mean, we can decide that. Um, initially, I think the thought was, it started out as for repairs and replacements, um, but if there's a condition on a building permit and the board would entertain that, that's an opportunity. Um, I've seen it done where it's only for residential in some uh, jurisdictions. It's, uh, so the, the, I guess the thought there is that for businesses, you know, they can kind of pay their way um, but it's, it's open to discussion and to interpretation at this point. You know, it's a program that we would set the rules on, so. Well, thanks, and just as a, a little bit of input, I probably, you're right, probably like other counties have done, the doing it on a residential would probably be the best thing with this kind of a dollar amount, um, because that'd be a tremendous help with a lot of people who are doing a, a small improvement that are then uh, requested to put sidewalks in or repair sidewalks, so I think that might be the most bang for our buck. Yeah. yeah, and I think it would be in a location specific, so not everyone's gonna be eligible. If you are in a location where there's no sidewalk on either side of you, maybe that's not the best fit, but if there's a stretch where you know, it's just missing in front of your house, that's a perfect solution right there. Good. Um, the, so SB1, with the funding comes strings, right? So. Um, we have to specifically identify the projects that we will be utilizing SB1 money for. Um, we're gonna be doing that in the subsequent item that'll be before you here after this one. But generally speaking, um, the, the projects are programmed here in the CTIP. We're looking at about $13.4 million in funds split up amongst three projects. Um, generally, their overlay 
two of the projects are bid out to contractor, one of which we do ourselves. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so we're almost there. I'd like to talk a little bit about what we finished this prior year, um, constructed over 50 miles of road rehab projects. Um, a, a big push this prior year, and then just starting now, actually you awarded it earlier today, is the last of our 10 million farm to market advance from Measure R. Um, so that money is on the street as of today. Um, that was a big help to get a lot of miles done. Uh, we completed a couple of bridges, did some major sidewalk projects, and a number of uh, school safety projects. Um, you know, despite COVID, it was actually a very big and successful year, probably the biggest I've seen since I've been with the county. So things didn't really slow us down there and the work kept going. Um, just a couple of photos and highlights of projects. Harvest Avenue, uh, again in Goshen, kind of as a result of the interchange project, some of those secondary roads needed to be re uh, replaced, or in this case, this one was a new road that was built um, just because it changed the traffic patterns out there. Um, a small project, but an example of one that we did many of uh, in uh, East Porterville, East Orange Avenue, a uh, safety project. The kids and the parents were parking on one side of the road, and there wasn't really a good crossing on to get to the school on the other side of the road. So put in a little bit of sidewalk and some flashing beacons there. Um, I'm particularly proud of this one. Railroads are tough to work with. They just don't answer your phones. <laughs> no, they don't. Um, I mean, I'll joke, but you'd almost if you get a hold of them, you go park your car on the tracks and then they show up. Um, but uh, so this was a railroad crossing project, hopefully one of kind of starting the, the momentum. Um, you'll see a lot of times in the past we would do an overlay and then we would stop 50 feet away from the tracks just because it's so tricky to get the permits, get the encroachments to actually do the work there. So um, kind of building on this, we're going to use some momentum to sort of uh, establish our relationships with the railroads. Um, one of the bridges that we completed, this one's particularly nice, but uh, it's a long drive up there at the end of South Fork Drive. Uh, if you do have a chance, go take a look at it. I think it's a very nice bridge, um, fully funded through the Highway Bridge Program, federal funds on this one. Um, or actually, I take it back, I think Major R had some, had a match on this one. Um, and then one of many, many miles of overlays. You know, it's hard to take an exciting picture of an overlay, but it's exciting to us. It's nice new black oil on the road, so um, a lot of work completed there. Um, this project in particular, 15 miles, so a, a pretty significant stretch of, of work completed. Um, not sure if this is me and my staff before and after going through the effort, or maybe you guys after sitting through the presentation but uh, hopefully we're all a little bit more like the gentleman on the left there. So with that, happy to answer any questions for you, take any direction. Um, this is a, a big action for us, so I appreciate your effort and your past communications and discussions on this. Janice, is this uh, your name up here? Okay. Any questions for Mr. Shanky? Uh, Madam Chair, just a real quick comment. Reed, uh, very comprehensive presentation, comprehensive plan. Uh, I do appreciate your uh, rapid response allocation. That's very important to be able to uh, respond to the calls that constituents place. Um, you know, it's easy to overlook uh, a road that many vehicles don't really travel on, but for that one person that lives there or for the few people that do drive that road to get from their home to where they need to go, it matters. Uh, and if we don't have that allocation to get uh, to those projects, they go overlooked. Um, Johnny and his team do a fantastic job in responding to uh, road re repair requests, uh, but your community outreach and effort to take in input from uh, residents through uh, town councils or uh, various unincorporated community outreach uh, efforts is very much appreciated. We have to be present in our communities to let them know we're hearing their concerns because roads are a very significant concern and um, you know people need to understand the, the overall approach, the philosophy, how money's allocated um, and the overall budget and I think that uh, uh, the more that we can educate the public, the better off we're gonna be, so thanks. Supervisor McCarry. 
You know, Reed, I went up and saw the South Fork Bridge. It's absolutely beautiful, uh, the work that was done there. And I, I'd like to thank you and your staff. You, you guys have been extremely responsive, and it seems almost like it's a daunting task, and it's never good enough because there's always somebody complaining. But you, and, and I understand, you know, the conditions, and so there, you know, they, but nobody ever calls up and says, hey, that's a great road. You know, I did get, receive a compliment on your staff uh, for something that was done in north of Exeter, so they, they were very complimentary about that. So I did want to pass that on because it always seems like it's just the, the beatings won't continue till morale improves, but you are doing an amazing job. And I just want to thank you. I, I don't know, does RMA have something that they, on your website, that you actually put these out that have been accomplishments and, and upcoming projects? A lot of people are, don't know, and maybe it'd be nice if we had something we could direct them there to at least give them updates as to what's occurring. That's a, a great point. Uh, we do post our, our monthly reports, which kind of in the weeds talks about it, but uh, probably a, a, a critique I could have of myself is that we're not very good at patting ourselves on the back sometimes, so definitely a good suggestion. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, also just want to thank you and your team uh, for the day-to-day -day work that you do, especially during the pandemic, as you connect communities, create pathways, and engage with communities for greater input and effective responses. And so, again, kudos to you and your team uh, as you continue moving our county forward. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I feel funny saying this. Is there any public comment? There's three people here, and they're all staff. Uh, any phone comments? Okay. Um, what do you need from us? I'll move for approval now. Second. Okay. Motion by Supervisor Vanderpool. Second by Supervisor Valero. Please cast your votes. Motion passes 5-0. Well, don't go far, you. Oh, you. <laughs> Our next item, number 37. Identify road rehab projects to be constructed using revenues from the California Road Maintenance and Rehab Act. Yes, again, Reed Shanky Resource Management Agency. Uh, this item really is here just for uh, continent, uh, uh, sequential continuity. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were good with the CTIP before we formally identified these RRAA or the SB1 projects. Um, once again, it's about $13.4 million worth of funding. Uh, in it, there's three proposed projects, two of which will be constructed by a contract, one by county forces, uh, 13 specific locations for about 29 miles of roadway. Um, all projects are currently scheduled to be constructed by October, fall of next year, 2022. So with that, happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Reed regarding this item? Do we have any public comment? Okay, I'll bring it back to the board. We have a motion by Supervisor Townsend, a second by Supervisor Macari. Please cast your votes. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, Reed. Thank you very much. All right, our next item is a request from Health and Human Services Agency to introduce an ordinance repealing 1965, 1970, 1975, just keep coming up, Stace. 1980. All right. Okay, I'll, I'll probably end up repeating this for you guys, but good morning, Madam Chair, Supervisors, Ms. Chiao and County Council's Office. My name is Stacey Chastain, and I am the Deputy Director for Public Health Operations with HHSA. And um, as Madam Chair mentioned, we are seeking that the board repeal sections 1965, 1970, 1975, 1980, 1990, and 2000 of Article 21, Chapter 3, Part 1 of the Ordinance Code of Tulare County pertaining to the bylaws of the Community Health Center Board. To give you a little bit of background on this, um, we have two health clinics within the public health branch of the Tulare County Health and Human Services Agencies. Those health clinics are in Visalia and Farmersville. And a few years ago, they applied for designation as lookalike status as a federally qualified health center. And so um, there's many benefits that that brings to the clinic and our uh, patients and our community. A few examples of that is the ability to seek certain types of reimbursement that we wouldn't get if we were not designated as such. 
as well as opportunities for our patients to be able to get uh, pharmaceuticals at lower prices through the 340B program. So it's really important that we maintain this um, designation. And um, in order for us to do so, we're regulated by HRSA, which is the Health Resources Services Administration, uh, or agency, which is at the federal level. And HRSA will uh, basically review all of our different policies and processes to ensure that we're meeting regulations. And a few years ago, um, in the beginning of 2018, we had a site visit in which they came and they reviewed all of our different policies. And there were a few findings um, in particular that pertained to our community health center board. Um, and so um, being that we are a little bit unique um, as a federally qualified look like and that we're within the Tulare County uh, government structure, um, we had to go back and take a look at what it was that they were seeking um, in terms of changes and then how that would impact um, potentially the uh, governance of our Tulare County Board. And so we had determined that there were a few areas that were um, in conflict with one another because there were certain areas in which they wanted our CHCB, our Community Health Center Board, to have certain authorities over this clinic. So we um, went to the drawing board, had those um, recommendations drafted up, and then we also went and um, submitted for a co-applicant co agreement with Tulare County um, Board of Supervisors. So that way we would have some sort of an agreement that says, yes, we're part of the county structure, and in these circumstances, the Community Health Center Board will have authority to approve, um, veto, et cetera, and then under these circumstances, they would not. And so in October, we came here and presented the co-applicant agreement as well as the revisions to the uh, CHCB bylaws, and those were approved. Our CHCB then adopted those bylaws in December of 2018, and they've been operating um, under them ever since. Um, but a few months ago, it was brought to our attention that the actual ordinances were never um, changed. And so as it exists today, those two things do not coincide. So although they were originally approved, we did not make the changes um, in the ordinances. So if you line them up, they would be in conflict with one another. So we're here today seeking approval to just repeal those sections so that if you, you know, sat down and looked through them all, they would be in concert with one another instead of in conflict. All right. Any questions for Stacy? And I'll entertain a motion. How'd you guys miss that? <laughs> I, okay. I know. I, I don't know. Fine. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, it makes sense. Some, often those things get overlooked, but I'm glad that uh, we've been able to codify this and we can move it forward so that we can continue operating. A motion by Eddie, so I guess I will not make a motion. So good I job will. sneaking in there and pushing the button. Now you're, you're So we have a motion off. by uh, Valero, a second by Tom Townsend. Please cast your votes. I, I know. All right. And Stacy, um, off top, well, off topic, a little off this topic, um, it's nice to see you here in the chambers. I hope things are, I don't know if I should say slowing down. I don't want to jinx anything uh, for public health, but I just want to thank you for all the hard work that you've done and your staff has done over the last 15 months or so. So thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. I hope things it. start getting better for you. They are. They're getting a little bit better, I think, for everybody. We're starting to feel that normalcy. Uh, we do still have a lot of work, and I think even as these uh, changes come into play and the normalcy is coming back, our role still uh, remains intact, and so we're going to continue to monitor the health and safety and just work with our community to get us back to normal. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. All right. Okay. And we have our last item, our board member uh, requests. Are there any requests to make a referral? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would like for us to maybe consider a broadband joint powers agreement um, for the county of Tulare. I know that there will be funds coming to the county uh, with regards to broadband and just making sure that we as a collective, whether it be the cities, the Tulare County Office of Education, the county, our IT department, that everyone come together to really look at how we, we can be best effective um, in, in terms of utilizing the potential funds that will be able to come to support our broadband efforts in the county. Okay, and I think Sup Supervisor Townsend, you're kind of working on some stuff there with uh, RCRC, so we'll incorporate all of this and see what we can come up with. And uh, before I 
go to Madam Council. When we took a break earlier, there were donuts in the break room and the box said from Matt. And I guess Matt is leaving us um, and going to HHSA or something like that. I'm not sure. Where are you going, Matt? I'll be in IT still. Oh, in IT, but, but not for the board. Is it something we said? He's just he's enjoyed us said? so much, and he knew that Larry loves donuts, so he wanted to bring donuts to help this board and well, say thank you. But thank you, Matt. We, it's been we, great working with you. We wish you the best. You have been. You're you're very attentive to our needs and in getting things taken care of, and we're glad you're staying at least with the county family. And we wish you the best. He got a promotion. Well, then he could. All right. Yeah, promotions you. out of our office, right? Yeah, that's it. It's to the trading ground. It's less pay, but it's not in our office, so he's a, <laughs> that's a promotion. Okay, with that, uh, Madam Council, <laughs> do we have a need for closed session today? Yes, Madam Chair. Item A is being pulled for a later date, and the balance of the calendar will be heard in closed session. I do not anticipate an announcement out. And I have uh, something to read before we enter into closed session. I have a financial conflict of interest under government code section 87100 regarding closed session item D. I will not attend the closed session for item D and I will not obtain or review any non-public information regarding the governmental decision. The clerk is requested to make this announcement part of the official public record of today's meeting. Uh, with that, regular session is adjourned. <laughs>